gratitude to the Kanyakahaga Nation for their teachings about the earth and our relations. At Fourth Space, we work with our university community to mobilize knowledge by co-creating daily activities, such as today's, that invite really Concordians together with external partners and audience members to examine research questions, initiatives, and class actions and development here at the university. So a big welcome back to Alice Chari and this year's Critical Materialities class to give you a bit more context about what you're about to embark on here today, it's my pleasure to pass the floor to Concordia University Research Chair in Critical Practices in Materials and Materiality, Alice Jarry. Over to you, Alice. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. <laughs> All right, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks to Ford Space and the whole team uh, for hosting this event. Uh, welcome to SCAPES, engaging with the micro and macro entanglements uh, of the Anthropocene. So this event is part of the course Critical Materiality, an advanced special topic research studio seminar uh, that aims to open up new perspective uh, and, and develop joint methods between design and computation arts disciplines, both graduate and undergraduate. Uh, there is a special emphasis on material engagement, making and process, and students develop objects, narrative, visuals, environments, performances, uh, and artistic and public responses to social environmental topics linked to materiality and material engagement. Today and tomorrow, December 2nd, students will present their final project and activate a public discussion, or what we call in the class, mediation. A large part of practice-based research transpires in form and in the experience of sensory per perception. What happens when the studio and our materials move to public space? How can a reflexive practice be communicated and experienced? How do we foster discussion around the climate crisis in public settings? Today, the event centers around the built environment, materials, both physical and digital, waste, infrastructures, and communities. Built environment can be understood as an entanglement among a vibrant infrastructure of actors, materials, and stages. We are embedded within broader systems that are mutually informed. Digital spaces and patterns of consumption to inform one another. Data collection serves commercial interest, leading to consumer waste. Each system is entangled, complicating questions of culpability in industrialization and consumer culture. Emily Bain, Andre Uranga, Patricio McClellan, Sarah Antoine Major, Mitchell Lanaki, Alex Chartier, Joël Collin, Manuel Souri, John Mendoza, and Sarah El Mamoun thus ask. How can our perceptions of materials as agential be redefined when focusing on a specific site? How can micro interventions uncover macro problems and our complicitness in them? First, uh, people on site will be able to tour the exhibition. So we invite the public on Zoom to stay with us uh, as the presentation and discussions will start in approximately 25 to 30 minutes. Thank you. Yeah, I will invite uh, the group, the public, everyone uh, here on site at Ford Space to uh, navigate the room, enjoy the fantastic projects. Projects are spread out uh, across the whole uh, space. So really have fun, enjoy, discover, experience. And we start the discussion in 25 minutes. So welcome back. Uh, we would I, like everyone in this space uh, to regroup in the middle for the discussion. And thanks for everyone on Zoom for your presence uh, and being with us this afternoon. Don't hesitate to ask questions uh, in the chat if you have any. Uh, the first project uh, will be uh, John Mendoza's project. And I would invite Sarah Antoine Major to introduce uh, the work. Hello. Okay, so we're just going to exchange space here. Hello, John. How are you? Back at Good home. You. Your setup is amazing. I really love it. Um, so I think I'll start with maybe my own understanding of your project, and then we can uh, go from there and ask uh, questions. Uh, so it was a bit hard because, unfortunately, I wasn't able to interact with your project, and I really hope I can do that very soon. Uh, but my understanding of your project was really about uh, the food waste, but especially in 
commercial and industrial setting, uh, if I'm not mistaken, and how these the processes of food waste going to landfill and how all of that issue of uh, materiality is a very invisible process, especially in our society, and how basically you wanted to create a project that was bringing this immaterial process and in, or invisible process something to, to bring it to a more material uh, level, so um, to make it more visible for people uh, by using different affordances of these food waste to create more things with it, to create more material and visible processes. So how would, would you say that's accurate? <laughs> Yeah, I, th I think it's a it's a it's nice to hear your interpretation of the project, even if you weren't you were you aren't like able to physically uh, interact with it. But uh, I think it's it's a pretty good description of what um, the goal with the project was, even if uh, the goal might have been um, fuzzy from the get go. It's still kind of fuzzy now, but it it uh, in the end it ended up being something that is uh, I think gives. The value to the waste that the that would have otherwise been thrown out. Absolutely, and uh, so what what um, what are the steps of your process? What what did you do to to find these uh, new affordances to your materials? I'm seeing a lot of elements on your table. Can you maybe walk us through them? Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna just like step away from this camera. Yes. Um, can you still hear me? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Um, hello, uh, so I have a couple of things kind of cooking. Um, so one of the first ways I kind of interacted with the project was to kind of look at um, my own culture and looking at um, some recipes that are, are uh, fairly popular in the Filipino cuisine. So I was looking at sisig as a way to kind of counter this kind of food waste, but even with a meal that is supposedly zero waste, there is still waste produced. And in that sense, that kind of led me to um, other ways to kind of transform these ingredients. So um, on this side over here, we kind of see um, jars of kefir. So that's like a fermented uh, milk using a bacterial culture. So I have a couple of jars going on over here with various food wastes inside Kind of transforming that material into something that could be potentially used or consumed depending on what uh, the ultimate goal is um, i also have some sourdough starter kind of like haphazardly placed over here and in that sense we're also using like food waste to kind of uh, use that in a transformative way and potentially have uh, design implications or possibilities um, I also just kind of experimented with like dehydrating a bunch of stuff. So I have here some like dehydrated sourdough that I uh, I put in a dehydrator that is that was lent to me thanks to Andre. So thank you, Andre. <laughs> um, I also have some dehydrated kefir, which ended up being fairly uh, brittle, and uh, some other pieces here that are becoming a bit more plastic after adding some glycerin. So there is some uh, material possibilities there. And yeah, ideally this would have been interacted with in person because I have some food that I'd like for people to enjoy and understand in relation to all of these other uh, components. But um, I think in this setting, having everything kind of fill up the space of the table um, gives that value, gives that, um, puts the element in, in the foreground instead of casting it away. So usually these wastes, like as uh, these bags over here and all of these other like um, residual material would, uh, would have otherwise been thrown away. But here I collect everything, even to like the materials that have been broken, let's say like this mug or um, all of these like little knickknacks that I've collected over the years are just like thrifted things that have been thrown away. So yeah, in that sense, this uh, is just a collection, kind of like a makeshift 
workshop of where the project is at. Well, let me just tell you on Zoom like this, you're, you're, it's giving very uh, postmodern Martha Stewart. <laughs> but that's a wonderful uh, answer. Thank you so much. And um, what would you, how would you say your goal evolved through that project? Because I know it was quite different from what you first proposed, I, I believe. Uh, so what, how was the evolution of that project? How did you live that? Um, I think that the end goal with having some edible component was um, still relatively kept, but in regards to going with one prototype and running with that, I think that's where um, my mind hit a block. So I decided to go with like the, uh, the idea of uh, multiplicity of these micro stage prototypes. So in the end, in this mode of presentation, the table sort of becomes the, the artifact, uh, kind of like a collection of ways or attempts of valuing our own waste in avoidance of just the throwing, throwing things in the, in the trash. So yeah, in that sense, I think instead of like focusing on one form of um, interacting with the, with this residual material, I decided to go through multiple ways. Yeah. Because I like, I didn't feel like I was like necessarily solving anything with going with one direction. So I, I decided to go for multiple directions. Yeah, I think that's what I, I like the most about your project is this iterative exploration of material. And yeah, I think it's very thorough and you did an incredible job. And I'd like to maybe open up the floor to other questions if other people have questions now. I know a lot of people seem intrigued. Does anybody have a question? Just raise your hand. Yeah. We'll get you on that camera opening. Okay. Uh, hi, John. Um, lovely project. I agree with the, the Martha Stewart uh, comparison. Um, it looks lovely. I was wondering if you, having done this, if you have um, changed your approach to cooking or maybe taken on certain uh, cooking projects that you might not have before because you have this added knowledge. Um. Well, thanks, Emily, for the question. Um, I think after doing this project, because I eat out fairly often and uh, never really took the time to like analyze my own waste generated from the from the restaurant from a customer's perspective. But uh, after having worked in the restaurant, collecting waste from there, and then going out to eat and seeing the waste that I was producing. There's waste being produced at every levels, so there's there's like kind of something that that I could draw from there in regards to if I'm producing waste, there's waste being produced at the macro level, which is like at the production level of uh, through farming or through um, manufacturing and delivering of these foods. Um, so it just made me think more about the seasonality as a, as a way to counter. Because uh, I think coming from a different culture and coming from a land that doesn't recognize winter as a season that um, is like hostile to most foods, um, it was difficult for me to kind of see how seasonality could play into like Filipino cuisine. So I think it's important to like think in that way if that answered your question at all. Yeah, if I understand right, it's like you understand the systems of food a little bit more and like how, again, like the cycles of seasons or locality, that sort of thing affects it. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. I'm unmuted now. Uh, anyone in the group has questions or comments uh, pertaining to John's project? Patricio? John, John, can you hear me? <laughs> um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the material collection and your experience um, 
you know, with working and how, yeah, just if you could speak a little bit more to that. Well, um, I guess like in regards to your, the material collection, are you, you mean like how I collected all of this waste or? Yeah, because I think that's an important part of the project is like your experience doing that. And um, like you were just saying, it's kind of like changed how you view um, maybe the business and the culture of, of restaurants. Give me one second. There's like a phone ringing behind me. I'll be right back. <laughs> um yes um so like like i said like working in uh just starting having started working in the, in the restaurant and uh well working with a uh, tsukiyomi bishop which is a, a ramen place nearby um who i would also like to thank for providing most of the waste collected for this project um it made me see like just like just through one day like the waste generated and uh it's kind of like uh mind-boggling and having to collect everything and have it, having it accumulate in my own home was kind of disturbing to see this this large amount of things that are unwanted or kind of like quote-unquote useless um and see them accumulate in, in the corner and like kind of like calling my name once the the pile started to just accumulate through time um because the restaurant was obviously very generous in providing a lot of eggshells a lot of uh, spring onion roots and uh edamame skin that is like virtually inedible but yeah like i don't know if that answers your question Uh, yeah, of course. Any answer is great, John. <laughs> well, I think, I think Chris has his hand up. Yeah, we have a question uh, in the Zoom room. Uh, Chris Moore. Hi, John. Um, <clears throat> uh, I don't fully understand the project. I haven't investigated, but um, I'm just wondering how perhaps some of these principles could scale up to more kind of mass production or mass um, distribution kind of channels? Um, I guess through this way, like uh, through doing things at home and like applying these methods, these culinary modalities and in an everyday sense, um, if everyone was kind of in, in engaging in this manner or even through um, looking at it from a design lens looking at like uh, potentials and the iterations through um, just seeing waste in a different light. Um, I think in that sense, like the way that the, the, like the direction of where waste usually goes to kind of can, can kind of be redirected in a different route to uh, to these larger infrastructures where they could like work with these things and work with the with these materials in a way that like better uh produces the uh sorry i'm not finding my words right now but yeah and just finding a way to like from like the macro level. So like, let, let's say from these farms and from these uh, different people that are involved in the production of food would be funneling all of their waste material to other ways instead of ending up in these landfills where they are put to no use and kind of stranded in these areas where um, they are just left to mm -hmm. kind of not, um, not D. So in that sense, there's a way to like just restream these materials and uh it's just like a way to like see how these materials can be restreamed in uh, everyday life sorry i don't know if that answers your question 
Uh, thank you, John. Uh, extremely interesting. Uh, I have a question, uh, if I may. Anyone else has a question? No, I may. Okay. <laughs> but first, I, I'd like to hear you. Well, this is a funny question. How do you see your fridge now? <laughs> I'm just curious because you worked with a lot of unloved leftovers material from uh, the commercial street, but uh, residential food waste is also something. Uh, so I'm just wondering, like, what is the, of course, like we all probably all, all compost, but uh, have you thought, for instance, about uh, recycling or re like taking food waste from your fridge re and making it re-enter in some artistic experiment or design experiment? Uh, how do you envision uh, this new relationship with waste? Well, I, I at least in the at, in my own fridge, like my parents were like upset of it taking up a lot of space because waste was just continuously accumulating and taking up like uh, shelves of uh, of fridge space. So. Um, in that sense, like I had to find alternate means of storing it. So because we were we we were heading towards winter, it was easier for me to store it outside and uh, just accumulate the waste there. But in, in, in a way, it's just it's still like hiding it from plain sight. Um, what was the second part of the, your question? I'm just I'm just wondering, like, what is your do you have any plans to work with, uh, I would say, waste from home? In as much as um, in as much as waste from uh, restaurants. Yeah, I think with looking at the waste from home, there is still like a lot of uh, possibilities there in, in regards to what it could uh, end up. Um, there's a lot of like vibrancy of like if you're looking at it from an artistic perspective, like uh, there's a lot of vibrancy in the colors that is produced in waste. There's a lot of um, bacterial activity that happens inside a compost bin. Um, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of life in these seemingly stagnant um, things. So I think it's like, a, there's ways to like interact with the piece that kind of like not me making something with it, but making with the things that are all already there. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. And maybe my last question before we turn to our uh, artificial intelligent collaborator. <laughs> okay. uh, question, do you have any plans for, Chris Moore spoke about scaling up, but there's also other ways of scaling up that is, say, engaging with the public. I see a very interesting performative display here on the table at your place. Uh, do you have any plans for workshops or engaging with the public into those fermenting experiments and waste repurposing? Because that could be a tremendous um, way of engaging uh, diverse communities with these problematics. Yeah, I think there's definitely an opportunity to um, scale this up in a way that communicates to others in regards to their own waste. Um, there's, there's a, I'm always thinking of how this could kind of be a more interactive um, workshop type uh, situation where people would be bringing their own waste and working with other people's waste to see what uh, what could be done with all of uh, the waste meeting in this one space. Um, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, dear Sarah, would I will let you navigate the AI collaborator. So, um, in an attempt to ooh, later, yes, okay, sorry. In an attempt to kind of uh, redesign or rethink this kind of um, interview situation we have going on, uh, we inputted um, all of our proposals and also uh, other information from this course into an AI that generated questions for us uh, to ask each other uh, while we interview. So these questions are fully uncontrolled and randomized, so they might not make sense, but we'll, we'll do with whatever the AI gives. So I'll generate the first question. Ooh. Okay. 
So, John, capturing and displaying the invisible creates the possibilities of what? <laughs> capturing and displaying the invisible creates the possibilities of what? Feel free to answer however you want. <laughs> I guess in this sense, like making all of these um, invisible or put like otherwise would have been invisible things visible and displaying it and capturing it in this format um, just already kind of like opens the realm to possibilities. Possibilities of what? I'm not sure, but possibilities that um, that might bring up the answer to the what, <laughs> if that makes any sense. That's an incredible answer. However, now we're going to go to what the AI answered to that question. And <clears throat> discourse and critical analysis is um, what the real answer was, but thank you for your guess. <laughs> so I think now we're going to go on to the next project, which is, uh, Patricio's project presented by John. Yes, so I will invite. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> Congratulations, congratulations, John! Yes. I will invite the group, uh, perhaps, to go closer to Patricio's project to uh, make sure that we're all together for the discussion. Um, John, you're still with us. We're listening to you. Alrighty. Um, so, unfortunately, I'm not physically there to be introducing the project. But I will. I uh, I received some photos and I saw the live stream show parts of it. So I'm going to do my best, but I'm not going to take up too much time so that Patricia could uh, present it. Um, so the project is called Gap Slack. Um, Gap Slack can be considered to be forms of mediation on the pothole, an assemblage of site specific interventions through uh, qualitative and quantitative data collection. Um, and through other means, um, as a means of addressing micro and micro problem, a, a micro problem, and on a micro on a macro scale, as a project embraces the uh, a form of disorganization and disorder, which is kind of inherent with the the idea of potholes and where they decide to pop up. Um, it's an it's an interesting catalyst for speculative process and the process led iteration, which is what was produced for this class. So I'm just going to pass this straight on to Patricio. Thanks, John. What direction do you want me to take right away? I'm looking at you for uh, for guidance. Uh, I guess from where I'm standing, would you be able to uh, just guide us through the uh, initial process of um how you interacted with these potholes and what kind of led to this form of presentation great thanks um i'm looking at this presentation right now and i think you said disorganized i definitely qu classify this as disorganized also scrappy um i had a really good time assembling this yesterday because it made me think about um a high school science fair I started with the idea of the pothole because I, I saw something that was really uh, omnipresent in Montreal, and it was a problem that was treated almost like a joke. And in uh, the privilege that I have of being able to travel other places, it was amazing to me when we would go to other places. Um, you know, I was out in Ontario, I was down in the States, I was in Colorado this fall and just the how different the quality of the infrastructure is. And I think my initial point was I wanted to explore why why we had this problem in Montreal. But then it got cloudy because I think to start opening that is to start critiquing the city as an institution. And ultimately, that's something I didn't want to do. I didn't want to get lost. Um, I didn't want to get lost in the problem, you know. So I decided to, I mean, this expression, throw everything in the kitchen sink kind of comes to mind where it became part data collection, like part um, quantitative data collection, part qualitative photogrammetry, 
site specificity in my neighborhood in Verdun, you know, I looked at one square block that's kind of at the crux of the neighborhood that interplays a lot with um, this initiative that the city of Verdun has had the past couple of years to close the main street to pedestrian traffic only during the summer. And it's this huge sell selling point and they brand it like the coolest street in the world, which I mean, anyways, I could go on for a while about that, but you know, it's like just, it's, it's complicated, right? But like when the borough tries to uh, empower these kind of alternative modes of mobility that aren't uh, car driven, how do they do this? They do it from the top down, but what's happening from the bottom up, from the bottom up? I mean, you have these disruptions, what I call these sites of distress in the surface boundary of the built environment. And I think they're super interesting because yes, they're omnipresent, but also they speak to this really deeply personal kind of material memory, this kind of lack of a thing becomes a thing. What kind of narrative, what kind of energy, energy, etc., does it take to disrupt the surface boundary of the road? And how can we use that as a means to address the problem of itself? Maybe we could play with scale, which you see here. Um, this is like photogrammetry of, of uh, a site-specific pothole at the corner of these two main streets, uh, Galt and Wellington and Verdun, you know, which was blown up to scale to actually cause a full disruption of any kind of vehicle traffic. And then you reduce the geometry to get a shape like this, and in doing so, you know, then another question comes up. Well, we're reducing this as a means to simplify it, but what's, you know, is an almost infinite array of complex vertices, like you see here in this natural shape, somehow more complicated than this like very unnatural oversimplification. So then what's our qualifier of simplicity? And, you know, playing around with scale, like a pothole is a problem a pothole is a problem caused by cars, but only a problem for for non car mobilities. So in that sense, it's very much invisible. But if we use scale to blow it up to the scale of the built environment, then we get something like this. And I ask in this project, is it play or is it a disruption of space or is it both? How does this depend um, on the perception of it? And then over here, I mean, we have some more site specificity. This is a little more of the data collection side, I started thinking about the life cycle of a pothole, how it takes interaction to kind of destroy the, to open the surface boundary. And then this allows for the expulsion of the initial material, but also allows for the collection, which you see here. And this is actually all the dirt that I collected out of this specific pothole. And later I collected a water sample, which if things go right, I will drink at the end of this present. No, I'm just kidding. That would be disgusting. <laughs> So that's kind of one thing, but then one other thing that started happening was I started thinking about, yeah, okay, this oversimplification, how was I gonna present all this information? I mean, to me, this still looks like a mess, but it's almost not messy enough. Um, Alice, when we were talking, we talked about Tomas Saraceno and, and the spider webs, 14 billions. And I started thinking about the web of intricacy and you could see here, in the um, kind of 3D mapping of the object, how when you zoom in, it is this like really complex array of vertices. And I wanted to represent the information that way, but somehow I don't think I could quite get there. I think it started becoming another project in of itself. So in that sense, there was a really interesting process leading process in this project where I was really able to like, I didn't start out with an end game. I didn't start out thinking that I wanted to solve a problem because I don't think, maybe I don't think, I don't, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but you know, it's like not getting lost in the literal problem. Like to have something that's incomplete is only means that I'm asking different questions, you know? Um, and I started thinking about these relations between institution. I'd like to quote Stereolab, because this is a great quote right here. Originally this setup was to serve society, now the roles have been reversed that want society to serve the institution. So I think that we can maybe think about our, I don't wanna say addiction to fossil fuels, but the way that our cities are built around car specificity as a dominant means of transportation. 
and how we are reacting to that, you know, and then I think I could go to Trevor Paglin, he's somewhere. Uh, space is not a container for human activities to take place within, but is actively produced through human activity. The space humans produce in turn set powerful constraints about upon subsequent activity. So it became this kind of really speculative process. And, um, you know, I was able to let go in it and maybe stop thinking so much. And there's a million trying to go in a million different directions all at once. And what we could think of this is, is a snapshot of a moment of investigation. And that's where I'll leave that. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, uh, Patricio. The group? Any question? Yeah, when you add. Oh, I think I turned it off by mistake. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricio, for that wonderful presentation. No, thanks, Manny. I was just wondering, um, in your in your opinion, uh, do you think potholes or let's say sinkholes are more of a natural phenomenon or a part of like some shoddy construction? That's a good point, right? Because I don't think maybe I. I positioned it like it's such a specific Montreal problem, but it's not, right? Um, I don't, I think it might be both. And I think that's like indicative, uh, or that speaks to like where this project's at, where it's like, it's not black and white, right? There doesn't need to be a dichotomy of it is or it isn't, or it's right and it's wrong. Like at what point, you know, with this drive to urbanization, like at what point do, I want to speak delicately here, but like at what point do processes that happen in the built environment, are they considered natural, you know? Mm -hmm. So, but also no, it's not a natural thing because I mean, well, sinkholes, yes, but I mean, in terms of a pothole, like you'd need to think about what the stress is that causes it. And it's like, that's a completely unnatural thing. So yes and no, mm -hmm. I don't know. I like, I don't know if I answered that question at all. No, this is okay. good. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you, uh, Manuel. Any other question from the group? Comment? John. Hello. Um, great project, first of all. Um, I'm just wondering, like looking at like um, all the iterations that you kind of like went towards, um, do you imagine like other ways of kind of uh, interacting with these potholes or ways to kind of um, bring to light these uh, these micro um, I don't want to say I don't know how to like say it because like uh, the pothole is like created by these cars but then in like at some point when the size becomes big enough becomes a problem to the cars mm -hmm. so how like how do you find more ways to make the problems evident from the get-go before it uh, becomes, I guess, less of a human issue, more of like a, because like there are humans inside the cars, but like, how do you bring it to them um, like sooner rather than later, I guess? Right. Um, in my research, I think I came across a lot of site-specific like pothole interventions that were more aimed around like filling the gap and making that kind of like an objet d'art, you know, like as a means maybe to crit critique the power structure. Um, but again, I didn't want to solve that problem. Like I didn't, I don't think that, you know, yes, there's citizen activism, but I don't know that solving the site specific problem is like solving the greater problem. But for me, it becomes, yeah, playing around with scale because, okay, so stop thinking about uh, okay, yes, there's the human scale, but what if we scale up and we, what if we start treating like the city as an organism, right? So I think scaling up, scalability is, is the way for me to continue speculation. Um, and then it becomes a matter of like, if you want to put it into the real world, then it's a whole other thing. Then we're talking about like guerrilla activism, but I mean, that's one way to completely disrupt, you know, any kind of like traditional flow of traffic at the site. Again, I don't know if I answered your question at all. I got the thumbs up. Thanks, John. <laughs> Thanks, John and Patricio. Uh, 
Any other question? Else I have questions. Okay, I think I'll, I'm gonna go with my questions. All right. <clears throat> I don't know if it's a question or comment, and I don't know <laughs> if you will answer properly because that seems to be the theme of the day. No I mean, apparently there's saying. no right. <laughs> there's it's no okay. right. It's okay. It's okay. There's no. There's no right or wrong. But I find what I find interesting in, in this project is well, first a question of scale, but the scale not necessarily at the, the material level, yes, but at the I would say social, environmental, political, and economic level. Because you took, and it resonates with John's comment as well, because you took this this pot all, which is a symptom of uh, a lack or a gap. However, uh, it's it's owl's fat. Of course, the, the, you have winters, you have poor condition, but you also have a whole package of uh, social economic factors and political political factors that contribute to creating those bottles mm -hmm. and i'm interested in 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 that moment when you realize that in your project and how it informed this kind of rhizomatic thinking around this phenomena because you you said it yourself you don't try to nail one specific solution on wall or one specific type of intervention it's rather i would say um, um, a kind of pleiad or uh, or multiplicity mm. of exploration. So how how does that how did that play out when you when you did your project, like in, in the making process, when you realize that okay, well a pothole is a pothole is like a um, I would say a multi-factor problem or condition. How can I approach that? Mm -hmm. So how did you parallel the multiplicity of agents? involved in the pothole and the ones in your practice? I think the short answer would be in talking to you oh. very frequently, <laughs> where it was like this week, I was like, oh, yeah, this idea. And you'd be like, oh, that's great. That makes me think of this and this. Like, go out in the world and look at more potholes and then come back and be like, no, I'm thinking about this. And you'd be like, oh, that's great. That was with, you know, but I think there was a certain point where it was like, oh, a pothole as a have not, right, which is affects disproportionately affects a specific community um but then in doing that it was like it's this really tricky thing where it's like i'm kind of trying to speculate but i don't i don't want to speak for people i can't just say like i started looking into okay the like the poverty rate and the poverty line and is this poverty line not a surface boundary that we all we all mostly live above of but what lies below it, you know, and so like really just thinking about this, I think I told Manny before that there's no dichotomy, but maybe there is in like the surface boundary, you know. Um, so again, I have no idea where I'm going with this. I have no idea if that answers your question at all. Or can you reorient the question? process of answering the question yeah. And yeah but because time is limited maybe we can pursue the discussion at the break uh, because I, I see that uh, we have uh, one last question in the zoom and then AI collaborator will I'm ask ready. you a question uh, so Chris Moore hi Chris hi um, this may be kind of ethereal but um, I just wonder like what your relationship between kind of grassroots kind of activism kind of like taking over the potholes and you know reclaiming them versus you know advocating for um you know uh i don't know like change at the municipal level you know like how do you reconcile those two kind of ideas yeah, I, it's interesting because I think it's like the DIY and kind of like the punk informs a lot of the things that I think about, but it's maybe about finding the space where they do coexist. So if you look at like a larger scale disruption like here, um, that's something that you could do yourself theoretically. It's something you could like build and deploy yourself, but it also would be large enough to literally attention grab at the at the kind of governance level if that makes sense so like finding a, a comfy place where those two things like coexist right perhaps <laughs> does that answer the question i'm gonna keep asking. i feel like that's a Muted again. I think we have to keep uh, the answer short because i hope that answers we, the question we have uh, another question by um Intelligent machine systems. Great. 
Hello. Oh, uh, I hello? am not the intelligence are you the AI? system, apparently. Uh, so we are back at it again with uh, the AI question. So I'm going to just go ahead. And mm, what would you hope to bring forth in the critical way of provoking? What would I mm. hope to bring forth in a what? <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> What would I hope to bring forth a critical way in provoking? As, yeah, perhaps. <laughs> what would I hope to bring forth? I mean, again, I'm just going to roll with this one. I don't think that there's a problem. Okay, hold on. <laughs> I don't think, <laughs> uh, I don't think that there's a specific solution that my process can bring forth in provoking. Um, and I think that's the proof that this was not scripted at all. So here is the answer. Sorry. Oh. Um, so conceptual thought through interpretation of the media, material surface, and method to display the information. That's exactly what I said. Exactly. <laughs> you answered the question perfectly this time. So kudos to you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> So thank you for your project, and I guess we'll go to the next one that Patricio is presenting. So the next project is by Emily Bain, introduced by Patricio. That's our <laughs> I'm back again. <laughs> um, I have the great pleasure of introducing a project by a great friend of mine, Emily Bain. Um, this is a project called Visible Movement. So I think what we're talking about in Visible, in Visible Movement, and Emily, we had the chance to talk about this this morning. We're talking about spaces for walking in the city. Um, and you were looking at really how they are dictated, interrupted, constrained, controlled, um, and how this affects your experience of traversing the city. But also it's a really kind of interesting narrative making because I believe there's, you know, I think there's something really endearing and personal about the journeys you mapped out. And it's a really kind of interesting psychogeography. Um, and we have some speculative end pieces here. So there's a high vis vinyl on, is that denim? Yeah. On denim? It says right there. <laughs> Uh, as kind of a practical point in speculation. So this is like really interesting because stepping just immediately from my project where I'm like, I don't have anything. Um, here we have something. So it's a practical point of speculation. In a sense, you're making, in a sense, you're making walking more accessible by empowering the user to control more space, to produce an accessible space. So this is empowerment. This is citizen activism, you know, like you speculated further also on a full clothing line. So before I go any further, I was hoping that you would maybe want to speak a little bit about your process and your experience here. Well, thank you for that lovely introduction. And it's so interesting how you can kind of find the point of a project as you talk about it. Okay. So that helps. Um, in terms of my process, essentially, um, it was an experiment in mapping followed by some speculation. So I would carry my sketchbook with me. I would walk around the city. I don't drive at all. So I would try and sort of take that perspective literally draw out intersections, um, crosswalks, uh, spots where the sidewalk ends, places where I thought, uh, places that I thought encapsulated sort of the hostility that one can experience by walking. Um, so I took those images, I literally mapped them or drew them onto this fabric and sewed them uh, with this high-vis vinyl. Um, I'm very grateful to my sewing machine, um, which handled it like a champ. Uh, so following that, I made these patches and then I took uh, these images and kind of mapped them onto these articles of clothing or in theory this one of these patches could be like pinned onto a backpack as I illustrated here or a jacket or anything of that ilk. So that's kind of a, it in a nutshell. Do you have another question or should I just keep going? I got some questions. I got some questions. Um, What's interesting to me is that the negative space 
if I can think about it this way, the negative space of the denim is actually like the hostile space, right? So in a perfect world where there was totally free accessible walking space, would this point of speculation just be a single sheet of high vis vinyl? It's interesting you say that because I was playing with um, reversing it and it, A, it didn't look very nice, um, and B, it's like you need to be visible where you're supposed to be walking. Um, I guess to answer your question directly, in theory, um, if what I'm exploring wasn't a problem if we had like car free spaces, for instance, um, that were more common, this wouldn't even really be necessary because there wouldn't be vehicles traveling at such a speed that they need to be able to see you at a moment's notice. So, um, yeah, um, I think that's that kind of answers the question. It's interesting because um, when I'm looking at it, it's like I'm I'm only looking, the eye is just drawn towards these accessible spaces, mm -hmm. right? And it's done in a really tasteful way because it doesn't yeah. convey like the absolute hazard of an inaccessible walking space, mm -hmm. right? But I'm just wondering, this will be my last question, I swear, before we move on to like uh, group questions. Like what's missing here? What can't we see when we look at the final project? Like what, I was hoping maybe you could talk more about like your process, mm -hmm. trials and errors. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a good, uh, nice open-ended question. Let me think. Uh, well, one of the things I had explored at first was mapping in kind of a more traditional um, sort of way. So looking at inspiration, um, soft surface mapping or like sewn maps are not uncommon, um, but a lot of them are bird's eye view. And um, I want to shout out a classmate who uh, pointed out how, how interesting it is that I did choose a bird's eye view, which is what we're used to with like Google Maps and, and you know, traditional forms of travel, I'll call it. Um, so from that point, I was like, what if I did it from a first person perspective? Um, and that way I could kind of, I don't know, skew the uh, perspective a bit, like with uh, this piece on the left, it's like, this is not remotely to scale, but I was trying to get across how like distant this other point uh, felt with every uh, every stop at every end of a sidewalk, every time you had to push one of those big buttons to get um, the light to change. Um, yeah, so there was a lot of messing around with like drawing out what a walk felt like, uh, like from literally from point A to point B and like writing out every or drawing out every interruption, every like torn up sidewalk. But I found what I landed on were these sketches because I felt that they were more visually pleasing. First of all, I felt that the graphics were very bold and I think to me at least it, it, it feels more relevant to one's experience, I think it's it's a little more easy to place oneself in this space. So yeah, I yeah. Think... Yeah, it speaks to the personal experience. And again, I think it's that narrative element, right? Yes, yes, yes. Where like you're not presenting some um, yeah, bird's eye view or like some impossible view. Like this is you really here at the street corner. Exactly. I think big button is interesting because I've never heard anyone say that before. So maybe you could yeah, speak I... to that a bit because I think that's also, that frames kind of your motivation pretty well. Yeah, um, I, I heard that term on, um, I forget which urban design blog, but um, it's, yeah, essentially whenever there's one of those buttons at a crosswalk that you have to push or you think you have to push in order to get the light to change. We have them around Montreal. I think they're, I don't know what I think about them. I think they're annoying. They're indicative of a greater problem. Um, also, fun fact, a lot of them don't do anything. They're just kind of there to satisfy this little sort of placebo, <laughs> like I'm doing something, I can go. But it does, I think that object kind of speaks to this, again, this limitation, this like, I need to ask to move across what could be like five feet, like nothing at all um, in an ideal world. I don't know pedestrians would have right of way, um, people could just move freely, but I know we're, we're far from that. And so we have these solutions, these zebra crossings, these whatevers, uh, which kind of work. <laughs> I think that's what I have to say about that. 
All right. Yeah. Uh, we're going to open it up to questions from the group. Hey. Oh, what's good? Congrats. Let's yeah. make some noise for yeah. Emily. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Anyone has questions or Sarah has questions? No. I, I, I changed my technology, so Ooh. this is yeah, advanced. Um, so I was wondering, the, uh, I think at the genesis of your project, you were hinting, hinting towards making like uh, an object base, but that was more airing towards like an accessory or something. And I was wondering what made you instead uh, visualize these uh, patchwork in wearable things, wearable accessories on these silhouettes? Which I think are amazing, by the way. Thank you. They're really good. Happy to say. Um, great question. Yeah, it started out. I think I had worked on a project uh, a year ago where I had worked with something roughly similar, um, mapping pedestrian spaces on a cushion and trying to like trying to illustrate through texture again the hostility and the limitations of space. But um, got some really good feedback uh, that it didn't really. The message didn't really come through because it's like a cushion doesn't have anything to do with walking per se, whereas this um, in talking with Alice, um, we you had suggested like maybe it could be something that um, could be worn such as a patch and I just thought that was a really interesting uh, direction to go because it's. I don't know it's literally on your body as you're moving around in physical space so what better way to um how do i put this wearables um i just like the idea of having something that was useful in terms of like you could put this on your body and be more visible in these spaces that are hostile um so exploring the visual aspect of and mapping and having something like an end product that was useful. Thank you. <laughs> Any other question from the group or from our guests? Um, Chris. Hi. <clears throat> I think uh, your design is really attractive, very uh, relatable, very accessible. The only thing I I wonder about is whether it's defensive. And I wonder if like maybe you're trying to address a situation that is much more infrastructural, you know, like maybe there's a problem with, you know, pe pedestrian traffic that that could be addressed rather than having to feel like oh, I have to put on this armor, you know, like in order to feel safe. Anyways, I don't know. That's a comment. I don't expect a response necessarily. No, that is very interesting you bring that up. Thank you for your comment. I did think about that, that it's, um, I don't know if it's dramatic to say, like I didn't want to veer towards like victim blaming, where it's like you have to, dress in such a way that you are more visible and I have heard that many times I'll walk around at night and say an all black get up and my mom will freak out and say you need to wear something or like if you're cycling for instance so I do think there is this aspect that it is very much more infrastructure um I don't know exactly where I land on like how like where this project interacts with the fact that this is more of a systemic problem and this is kind of a band-aid solution but it's I guess also on a more pragmatic level, I, I think like high vis vests aren't the most um, those like great big yellow and orange safety vests aren't aesthetically very very pleasing. And I was wondering like, what if I were to take this material and make something that was a little bit more wearable? So that was one answer I had to that little conundrum. Oh, thank you, Emilia, and thank you, Chris. Uh, any other questions, comment? Oh, yes. One second, we'll bring you a microphone. Where? Oh, thank you, Patricia. Hello. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, it's just more of a fun question, but I'm just wondering, did you think at all about color and what the color meant, that the color that you've stuck with, which is the traditional colors of the orange. Mm -hmm. And what would it mean if they were other colors or 
did that come up in your brainstorming at all or anything? It did a little bit. Um, I thank you for the question. Um, I didn't think too far ahead aside from uh, like what vinyl, what reflective vinyl is available to me. Um, and yellow, I think I picked because it is the, I don't know, the color I associate with the street. So it felt like thematically relevant. That being said, I think adding in more color could be really interesting. Maybe, uh, I don't know, maybe I could make more detailed sort of maps with different colors or, um, I don't know, just, just take it the next uh, to some like next level of experimentation, but I didn't think too too hard about that. So, thank you for that little prompt. All right, there's three minutes left. I have questions. Yes. <laughs> I, I find uh, conceptually interesting that uh, both your projects are side by side, Patricio and uh, Emily. I think there are uh, correlations in terms of method and issues. Good. So I'm I'm just wondering. Um, it's, it's a process-based question. Uh, it starts from a personal experience, but you developed this very interesting ethnographic process where you did an ethnography of the street and also an ethnography of attending to how you felt and how unsafe you felt and where. So it's a, this correlation between the street uh, derive, I would say, or uh, form of psychogeography uh, and design is extremely um, fascinating. Uh, could you speak a little bit about that and how you developed that process and what kind of, because it's, it's not always a given to be extremely rigorous in terms of documentation. How was it to develop that process of, okay, I document everything, every, every time I walk, I pay attention to this specific thing. How is it to carry that problematic with you as you walk? Uh, great question. It's honestly, it's kind of frustrating. Um, and it's sort of a mindset that I do carry with me. This is kind of one of my favorite things to be angry about because I don't have a driver's license. I don't, uh, and I do primarily walk to travel. So, hmm, um, I guess it was just, I just tried to be aware of where these limitations felt the most pronounced, um, and just always having uh the means on hand to record it um because i feel like there are images of hostility everywhere but i was trying to get across to maybe somebody who for instance was a habitual driver or didn't really think about this sort of thing what scenes would really clearly get this across as best as possible so um i have a bit of a mental catalog of like say intersections that i find particularly um hostile or like long to get across or particularly scary like uh this one on the on um i guess my right uh on the left uh is uh an intersection on to carry which um for those of you who aren't aware is a very very busy street um so you cross and you're on this little tiny island and then you cross again and then you're finally over the other side and i just really wanted to express the sort of precarity of like this is not a lot of space. Like I feel like a, a fleshy human that could be hit at any instant by by a, a car. Um, so yeah, I, I think I just wanted to try my best to, to communicate that and keep a mental list. Hope that answers your question. It does. Thank you so much. I think we are ready to uh... take it over to the AI. Oh yeah, time for the eight ball. Take it over to the machine. Yes, let's do it. Are you ready? So ready. Let's go. Where does the field of urban design predominantly exist? I think this is the most direct question yet, so thank you, AI. Take your time. Um, I could answer this very simply and say it's, it's very much in academia right now. Um, I think it's very much the domain of, of wealthy people, mostly white people, um, and uh, which is kind of funny because it's like cities are, everybody lives, not everybody, mm -hmm. but like, a city is by definition a huge swath of people and yet it's not very it's not a field that's very accessible to say a lay person or anybody outside of the ivory tower uh, i think that's yeah academia. okay show me wealthy white academia <laughs> academic and bureaucratic <laughs> spheres <laughs> fantastic all right 
Uh, well, thanks to our first presenters, uh, Patricio, uh, Emily, uh, and everyone. Thank you, thank you so much, and John online. We will take a um, um, 10 minute break, just a stretch move. Uh, and after that, we will uh, move on with Sarah Mamoun, who is on Zoom. Uh, so stay tuned, our online public and inside public. Enjoy the break. So welcome back, everyone. Thanks for your patience. Uh, the next project is by Sarah El Mamoun, who is on Zoom. And I would invite Emily Bain uh, to come here and present the project. All right, hello, welcome back. Um, let's see, so uh, my understanding of Sarah's project is that it explores the human impact of the built environment by re-examining light and noise pollution as an aesthetically and conceptually charged media scape. So I'm very interested to see how this goes. I understand you have some slides, so if you want to take it away. Okay, hello. Um, just going to go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So, can you still see my screen? So I have, I wanted to bring my project into um, one of the booths at Fort Space, but uh, I'm going to just give some context and um, talk about my research and process and then finally go through a live uh, demo. But um, I'm going to go through a video first. Um, Okay, so I want to talk about my um, process first. So I was initially looking at uh, light pollution data in uh, cities and creating links between uh, light pollution and uh, the urban environment and the human's impact on it. So I researched uh, different light uh, data satellites and algorithms that correct and fill uh, the gaps in the data. And then I had to research different ways of uh, unwrapping this data and working with softwares that uh, can process these formats. And I finally got a map render of light pollution over a certain period of time, and I realized that having the coordinates alone will not be sufficient on a sensorial level. Uh, so I developed my first prototype, um, which consisted of a projection uh, of this map through water as a medium. And it occurred to me that light does not exist uh, on its own. <laughs> And so I integrated noise pollution. Here, my research expanded into a broader understanding of the human impact um, in cities. And um, I went out and got an audio recording of noise pollution in the city. And then uh, I flashed my values. Um, I mapped these values from to, to values from zero to 255. And um, this was kind of my way of, of um, allowing noise to interfere with light uh, as material. And I flashed these values to my vibration motors. Um, I was hoping this GIF would play, uh, but it formed ripples on the surface of the water that I thought I could work with. And Due to my choice of material, I wanted to research artists who utilize light in their uh, work. And um, I attended a workshop by Jonathan Sims called Light as Material. And he shared his knowledge of um, using light as material uh, and medium for art. 
And I was also inspired by many artists who used light uh, through other mediums, such as uh, Anthony McCall with smoke and um, Thomas Wilfred with uh, colored gels, stained glass and uh, electric motors. And similar to their work, I am trying to give volume to uh, pollution data through the materialization of light in space. So my materials consisted of, I took the risk of, of not knowing uh, what materials I should work with. I, um, I was experimenting with many mater materials and mediums. Um, but my main materials were light and vibration with water as a medium for light and dichroic glass pieces um, in the which are placed in the water, I will show you now, and a magnifying Fresno lens. Um, so the, the choice for adding the extra materials like the lens and the dichroic glass is to emphasize the complexity of the urban um, lightscape and soundscape that exists in the built envir environment. Um, and this is cons still considered one of my first prototypes. Um, so um, the electronics are my Arduino microcontroller and vibration motors that I um, assembled and a motion sensor. So in the context of the fourth space event, I wanted to bring my enclosure uh, that housed this light and vibration system. And um, I also added a motion sensor that would detect when the humans, um, when the human interferes into the environment. And it would go brighter, uh, causing the erasure of um, the ambience, uh, the projected ambience. So I want to share my research questions with you. And I know I don't know how I'm going to. OK, I can see you all. <laughs> um, so I want to share my research questions. Um, so how can I represent this transformation of data from one medium to another in an experimental setting? So basically, this is my attempt at transforming this data using this medium, but how can it be more effective through other mediums? And how can I emphasize the role of the human interference um, in, in this transformation of data? So my way was adding the, um, the motion sensor with the light that would go off as the human interferes. But uh, I'm interested in other ways of emphasizing um, the human's complicitness and, and um, light and sound pollution in the urban environment. And finally, the um, what kind of affordances am I, um, does this um, different source medium uh, materials afford? Um, let me go through. So this is how my setup uh, currently looks. And I'm going to share my other screen and talk to you through my phone. So I'll be... joining in a second. Okay. So I realized that this doesn't give it justice, but okay. <laughs> okay, I can hear you now. Sorry about this mess, but I was trying to figure out how to show a live demo and um, also show my slides. <laughs> But yeah, I will reshare my research questions. Um,
And if anyone has any input um, on the project itself, or um, if they can... Question? Sarah, can the public ask questions? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, great. Uh, so, group, any questions for uh, Sarah and Mamou? You do? Yes. Okay. Hello. Hello. Oh. You wouldn't imagine I'm a computation arts student. Uh, <laughs> so I was wondering, I, I know from the uh, beginning of your project, you really wanted to talk about like light, light pollution, but there's also a big material. Water is a big material now in your project. And I wanted to know like, what, what was the thinking process with integrating water in this light themed or topic uh, project? Yeah, so um, I was thinking of water as a facilitator to transform or visualize this otherwise invisible like noise pollution. And it would be it kind of giving volume to my data with working with light uh, on a surface. So I thought um, water is is could be the perfect medium for that, but I am interested in experimenting with other um, mediums. Thank any, you. Any other questions? Good. Yeah. Take the microphone. Hi, Sarah. Beautiful project. Um, I was wondering if you had any idea of like the scale that you might want to um, create this at if you were going to develop it further. Mm -hmm. So thinking of scaling it, I was thinking more of, of how this would be um, a better representation of light pollution data um, by integrating live uh, real-time data. So that would more um, emphasize like the, the complexity of our urban uh, lightscape. So it would be kind of um, using live uh, real-time data instead of my uh, voice recording or audio recording. And um, I would definitely experiment with other lenses and materials I could shine light through and see what um, ambience I can create. <laughs> Oops. For the question, uh, before we uh, let the AI speak, I have a question for you, Sarah. Um, you know, sustainability is sometimes uh, complex and we can't address every aspect at all time is totally normal. Uh, and you, speak, you spoke about, okay, the, the problematic of urban light pollution, which is totally linked to uh, anthropogenic activities and urban spaces and cities and densities. And I'm just wondering, because now you play with, say, uh, dichroic glass and electricity, are you thinking about, uh, did you have this reflection about uh, alternative energy sources to address this question of light pollution? Because of, co of course there is the light emitted, but there is the energy consumed in the process. So what, is it, what are your thoughts in terms of electronics? Because we, electronics are also an issue, but not only in your project, in many, 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 many projects. So have you thought about, say, alternative energy sources or thinking about how to minimize uh, the consumption of your LEDs of, of, or your piece? I'm just curious. Yes, uh, I initially wanted to use actual light pollution, so I would be transferring that into something um, like more, uh, we can work with light that is leaking into spaces that um, it's not supposed to uh, be in. But unfortunately, in the context of this um, uh, project, I couldn't utilize this low light, but ideally I would use actual light pollution um, and not produce more um, and contribute to the problem. For your answer. Uh, and I think uh, our AI has a question. Great. Yes, so we'll let it, let it take it away. I can't see. Okay. So. <laughs> Ooh. How can we recontextualize our modern fossils? Amazing. Um, Who's that? So in general? <laughs> they developed an AI for uh, asking questions. <laughs> Yeah. So recontextualizing our modern fossils. I mean, 
this is one way of recontextualizing our modern fossils. I think uh, it's a good example of, of utilizing our, our like complicitness in, in um, the creation of like modern fossils and in the urban environment um, and making it into something that we can kind of an ambient atmosphere. I'm, I'm really struggling to put this into my uh, project. <laughs> but no, I'm interested I think in seeing what the bot things. <laughs> I think your answer makes perfect sense and absolutely. But let's check out what the AI has to, to say about it. So novel and situated narratives, I think is a fair answer and relates to your project a lot. So thank you so much for this. And I guess we'll take it to the next project. Um, all right, do I show on screen? Yes, okay. Thank you so much, Sarah. So the next project is uh, by Andre uh, Uranga, uh, introduced by Sarah Almamun. So maybe we can stay here while Sarah introduces the project because we have her with us. And then we are moving the other side of the room uh, to appreciate uh, Andre's project. Yes, so although I wasn't there to experience the and navigate through Andre's space, um, I'm just gonna give a brief, brief uh, intro about um, what I think it's about and then leave you to go to the actual space. <laughs> so uh, Substances uh, by Andre Uranga Gutierrez seeks to use sound and uh, scent as modes of communication to promote an alternative way of understanding the impacts of low-income neighborhoods within the Montreal metropolitan area. Um, okay, I can't see where you are. Andre, would you want to take over? I, uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. So I will invite everyone to go the other side of the room. Thank you, Sarah. Uh, so uh, right before explaining anything to you guys, uh, I would like for you to kind of sense the environment, go ahead, you can touch, move, smell, whatever you please. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 it's basically, so basically, um, this is the liquid that came out from this, and this is the kind of uh, technology to give, uh, to kind of diffuse the scent. <laughs> yeah, especially that one, eh? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so I guess this is a part where I explain why the hell I have you smelling off a bunch of weird stuff. Uh, so uh, like Sarah briefly said, uh, I was really concerned about the way uh, we're bombarded with information nowadays. Uh, but most of that information is often um, done through channels. Oh, this is inspiring. <laughs> uh, channels of communication that oftentimes abstract uh, subjective experience leave very little place for subjective interpretation of uh, those said disparities, social disparities. So um, one of the first things that uh, really grabbed my attention is this idea of smell and how smell as a sense uh, doesn't really get um, promoted as much as we would like to. And uh, within that, um, I guess 
I was also interested in the sound component and what it is to live in those said low uh, income environments. And so for me, one of the most uh, important things was to really understand how people got to understand or rather sends that information. They don't really care about what statistics says, what articles say about what they have or don't have in those type of neighborhoods. So one of my first approaches was to deal with it uh, through what we call uh, in French, uh, cartographie sensible, which in English translates to sensible cartography. So it's this idea of instead of focusing really on maps, very accurate maps and distances, rather find ways in which uh, one could interpret or rather sense, feel that uh, type of information, right? So to get there, um, I collected objects during this trip that I had on the neighborhood Saint-Michel, considered to be one of the worst neighborhoods in the Montreal metropolitan area. And um, it was really a walk in which I tried as much as I could to maintain my eyes closed for the simple reason that I wanted to allow other senses to interpret that type of data, right? So in this case, uh, I found a lot, a lot of garbage, uh, which led me to grab mostly was from uh, fast food. And it made it really, really interesting because um, we consumed the food, right? So one would expect when they see McDonald's, this little McDonald's box to kind of smell, I don't know, like a Big Mac, right? But what's interesting enough and kind of poetic is that it is actually the cardboard that stays, right? So this is certain sort of like residue of grease and cardboard. Then I did a, I opened my Nike uh, running app and did a whole uh, itinerary, a whole lap. Uh, and within that lap, I collected cigarette butts. Um, which is something that kind of was a smell that kind of came to me most of the time. You pass in front of shops, people, employees were like smoking all the time. I would get like these whiffs of like smoke. Then I found this little corner uh, that smelled like uh, human residue. And I put some gloves on, put it in a Ziploc. And uh, yeah, the then this one I was traumatized by this one. So I really approached myself. I, I kind of took the glove, smelled it again. I was like, I don't need two um, samples of the same type of smell. But I was surprised to uh, find out that not all of the clothing that we find in, in the street is actually dirty. This one just fell from one of the hanging lines. And so it was the smell of this is kind of like um, lessive, so like uh, clothing detergent. And uh, then I came into the next step is how to extract this data, right? How can I create a narrative? And that narrative was through what we call steam distillation. So it's, uh, uh, I would like to say simple, but <laughs> not so much. It's a DIY process, it's DIYable. Uh, so basically what you do is you have a pressure cooker you take out the little bell uh, and you insert, um, in this case, it was like a plastic tubing that connects it to a copper wiring. And that copper wiring, you kind of bring it down in a spiral and put it in a bucket full of ice. In this case, nature helped me. So that was really fun collaborate with nature because I just grab a bunch of snow. Um, and in that, so you put the object with water in the pressure cooker it steams, the steam grabs the smell without, let's say in this case, the cigarette, we can see that the water, it's pretty, it's pretty clear, um, but the residue that was left in the pressure cooker, I will lift it up in like a light bulb and light would not get through. That's how like black it was. So it's actually kind of very interesting to see also how that data is transformed in which we can send cigarettes in this case we can see it but if i just do that you know you don't see the cigarette anymore but you can still sense its presence the same way that people sense the presence of those modern fossils actually 
And uh, then when, once it evaporates, the vapor goes to the iced copper wire and it re-becomes liquid, but this time kind of purified, kind of, because it still retains all of the smell. And that's how I made this, these uh, scents um, that maybe made me question about how either lucky we are or how blind we want to be about the way these smells were all smelled during my trip, right? But um, coming from a neighborhood near there, the only thing that makes me go back there are my parents, right? So um, it's really easy for us to forget about these absent uh, places, but con interpreting or rather the narrative that also these objects say is that all these objects can be found in homes. As a matter of fact, they were either found in the street or were donated by people that lived in the neighborhood. So um, what really ends up saying is that it creates a tension between what we could call a home and what other people could sense as being something sub, like as something non-desirable, right? But they hear these noises, they smell these smells, but despite that, they still have the, I don't want to say braveness because it's just what their environment is, but they still call that a home. So it's really about questioning how we interpret that information and actually allowing the subject, meaning the reader, in this case, the experiencer, to actually create a narrative on their own. That's why I also decided to let you experience about uh, this installation before I actually said a word. Uh, I'm, I'm good, I think. <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Andre. Uh, I would like to know if the public has a question. You have a question? Where is our microphone? Maybe we'll use yours. Up to you. Yeah. Can you hear me OK? Is this OK? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sweet. Um, there's a lot here about just so much sensory activity. Um, I was wondering for you, like what cuts through the noise and the senses? Like what, like when you're walking through this neighborhood from your own personal experience and also as a researcher, artist, designer, like what really comes through for you? What really comes through for me is like the dichotomies, the, the different experiences from what um, we might read, we might hear, uh, in 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 uh, news news or or journals uh, newspapers sorry and um, you know a little anecdote I actually lost my phone you know and uh, people helped me went bes right beside me and helped me find that phone and I found it and it was this Mexican worker that was doing some renovations in one of the houses and you know he had the decency oh, and the respect and the, the, you know to like call back the number that I called him first and you know he went to me he gave me my phone so again like you know it was this kind of like emotional roller coaster because that's also where I kind of grew up I had a lot of friends there so you know it was actually very hard to kind of analyze that uh, without necessarily putting that subjective part, but then I actually made peace with it. And it's like, it's about subjectivity because what I want people to feel is that subjectivity. So I guess that's what I caught through is like, maybe it was a later, a later kind of like curational perspective. I wanted to be as objective as possible, but then I realized that why do that if the whole experience is about letting the subjectivity like take the, the lead. I don't know if it answered your question. Yeah. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, do we have any uh, other question from the public? From the group? No? OK, I think uh, if I saw correctly, I think Chris has a question online. Uh, thanks. Um, I just wondered, like you're describing these kind of environmental um, kind of sensorial experiences, you know, within a particular community. But I wonder if you've investigated a little bit more about kind of like personal 
kind of, um, you know, like, like, well, frankly, body odor and, you know, like uh, uh, pheromones and like how those kind of in kind of intermingle with uh, some of your uh, your research. Uh, I did think a lot about that, actually. Uh, I think that was one of my initial um, ways in which I wanted to uh, build on. But um, the, the, the only problem is, or the, the kind of difficult, delicate thing is that, um, you know, um, body odor is so personal. And the person that I took it with, uh, from, sorry, that I took it from, um, would really have a saying into what type of dialogue or what type of narrative it would give. And let's say if by any circumstances I had uh, mostly immigrants or mostly what, you know, like it, it, you enter terrains in which you, it kind of broadens a lot of the, of the spectrum of research. And I guess it, I didn't feel comfortable embarking on that and part of it is also because of uh, time limitations, right? Um, it was give, it was done within a framework, and that framework uh, had to respect a certain timing. And I didn't feel capable of making it justice within that limited amount of time. So that's what led me to objects that are detached from from the from the from the human itself or from human experience, and also. Uh, the other part of the, the answer is that I wanted really, given kind of also the title of the um, class, which is uh, uh, critical materiality, I really wanted to um, give agency to objects. Thank you, thank you Andre. Uh, before uh, giving agency to our AI, I have a question for you. <laughs> sure. So uh, I'll go. Sorry, I'm oh, moving yeah. all the way. But just... <laughs> yeah, but basically, thanks. Thanks for this project. It's really interesting. I like the forensic process uh, involved in the, in the whole research. I have a question about the the tableware and the perfumeware and the otherware, because what's interesting is that you take uh, basically uh, smells uh, of social environmental problematics in certain urban environments. Then you bring them in the realm of the sense, senses and the whole sensorium of, of smell and the haptics. Uh, but you kind of re-gentrify them in a very, um, uh, I would say, ritualistic setup. Okay? Yeah. So I'm just curious about this kind of tension between the, the, the issue you explore versus the, uh, I would say, how posh uh, the, yeah. table, the dishware tableware is. And have you considered creating other forms of more customized object uh, in the future? I, I yes, thank you for the question. Very interesting. Um, if had I had the time, uh, I would have definitely done a lot of objects myself. But I felt that um, this kind of customization uh, was sort of to give it some sort of a visual poetry. And the whole whiteness of the whole thing is supposed to it's often used in gallery spaces as a neutral environment and it's just I wanted to kind of play with that idea of white whiteness uh, or bleaching and kind of uh, say that no matter how white it is if you look closely and I always put a little circle showing you what it was before that no matter how times how how hard you try to make it white uh -huh. it still is kind of it still has agency so I, I guess this kind of poshness is kind of like a deliberate one to kind of to like no matter how posh we want it to look like no matter how politically correct we want it to or not dire we want it to look like there's still traces of personality and uniqueness and uh, culture within those mm -hmm. white objects okay. so maybe yeah. that's that's the yeah. the the whole theory or concept behind it. Thank you. Uh, perhaps our AI will let you expand on that. Uh, do we have a, one quick AI question? All right. I can't guarantee that it's going to be a quick question. <laughs> but I can guarantee, that, I can't even guarantee that it's going to be a question. Here we go. All right. What are two separate things? <laughs> I mean, is the consensus that we skip this one? No. 
All right, can, okay. Uh, Andre, what are two separate things? Jeez, I didn't study for What this is the emphasis? What, what's the word you emphasize in that sentence? What are two separate things? What I mean, you can go all philosophical on this, you know? Well, time, say, is like, time is limited. <laughs> I, could, I could, like, bullshit my way through if you want. Like, is this really separate? They're connected conceptually, right? So what are two different things? Maybe visually you think these are completely separated. If you found them on the street, they were separate, but they all were connected in a way. So I don't really believe that there are such things as separate things. Everything oh. is connected in one way there or another. And then what does the AI answer The AI that? says... <laughs> Physical materiality and digital space are two I got it separate wrong. things. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I try okay. my best. All right. Thank uh, you. Thank you. Uh, um, all right. So we are moving to the next project uh, by Alex Chartier, presented by Andre. So we invite you to move over here. Yeah, what? Uh, 5.30. 5.30. Hello. All right. All right. So welcome, everyone. <laughs> I hope you're not tired of hearing me still. Um, I'll try to make it brief. Um, so yeah, this is uh, the project of uh, Alex Chartier. Uh, it's named uh, Invasive Scapes. And um, it basically focused on water mill foil, which um, Currently, we know that there are six in Quebec, and one of them is invasive. So it really, I really want to put some emphasis on the word invasive because it's something that um, instilled a lot of uh, inspiration for Alex. Um, one of the, out of all of these, uh, all rather out of all the six, only one um, type of uh, water mill foil is invasive and is the Eurasian water milfoil. And so what she wanted to explore is um, how once you have it closed up or once you look at it from different perspectives, rather, um, it, it really makes you question about the scalability in which us as beings also go through maybe being invasive ourselves, right? Um, in this whole idea of spread or invasiveness along is the synonym is also colonization, which is uh, uh, through these beautiful uh, photographs uh, taken by the microscope, it really helps you decontextualize uh, this idea of what could colonization look like in some type of way. And it really makes us questions also as humans and how to deal with that. So one of the ways that we thought how to deal with water mill foil, it was to rip them out of uh, their natural habitat, but particularly Eurasian water mill foil, it actually tends to make it worse. So having said that, I think that it really makes us questions as human beings, our own interpretation. Thank you so much for is that. that too. Is that it? Yeah. yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, thank you. I'll continue on the subject. So um, I started the project um, because I discovered that species uh, in the Laurentide area. Um, and I discovered it was actually an invasive species and Quebec is doing its best um, to prevent more lakes to be invaded by this species. So I kind of started to look at it uh, in October and I really wanted to, well, I love biomaterials and bioplastics, and I was thinking about taking this invasive species uh, as a raw material to create bioplastic, to insert it in a circular economy for other designers or architects to use it. And I also started to wonder what was my relationship with the species, so I started to collect some of them. And I also known that uh, the way I collected this 
the invasive species was actually uh, the bad way of taking it. Uh, actually, the Eurasian water milfoil, milfoil has the particularity that if you just cut a part of it, it could actually root again. And so there's a lot, um, it invades lakes and it stops the light to go to the other species. So it's really uh, like not good for the ecosystems. And so there's like, government um, took many ways to take out this plant of the lakes. Uh, there's multiple ways, but it's really, it's really expensive and it's really hard to, to get rid of them. Um, so I was thinking by collecting them um, as it's also like a, a mark of resilience. Uh, I collected them in like October and they're still beautiful and um, living. <laughs> and so I dried some of them. Uh, there's like powder of uh, the Eurasian species and then the Northern, so indigenous um, species. And so there's, of course, I looked at it in the microscope and I found them really, really beautiful. And I was thinking how it's actually a, a special way of tackling the, the, the problematic because it's, it's really in, endangering uh, the other, like our ecosystems, but um, I actually find it beautiful. And so I think there's beauty in all of the different weeds also. Uh, I found a really beautiful quote from uh, David Gisson from Sub Nature. So not only do weeds get in the way of space, but they are also perceived as alien encounters, suggesting new roles that spatial formation might yet take. And so I think landscapes now, uh, landscapes of Quebec, also include that invasive species. And I think as designer, we can tackle the project. We're not, uh, we're not scientists, but of course, I think finding beauty in those things and using them because they're gonna be, and for a few years after like today, <laughs> there's gonna be a lot of raw material of, of um, Eurasian water meal foil. And so we can tackle the project and instead of putting them in landfills, using them as a raw material to create other um, objects or, or uh, construction material, there's so many options. So it's really tackling the, pro the problematic as a positive way of taking that um, invasive to, to create a new project. Yes, so thank you. <laughs> I like hands to applaud. <laughs> Th thank you, Alex. Uh, do we have any questions from the group about the milfoil? Yes? Where's our microphone? Oh, there's one here. Beautiful project, by the way. I love the projections. Um, I was wondering if you did encounter any like examples of how this material could be used um, in specific. Uh, yeah, so at first I thought it was actually an algae and uh, I actually approached the, the species thinking of algae um, and alginate, so this, this link substance in, in algae, but it's actually more of a plant water plant than an algae. So it's, I think it will be more used as a fiber. And when you think about fiber, there's so many different options. It's just also to test it with different uh, liants. <laughs> Binders, thank you. So there's, uh, there's many, many options, but it's really a, like using it as a fiber. Got it, makes sense. Yes. Any other question? No? OK. I do have a question. Yes. Uh, oh. No? You had? No. no, no. no. Yes. <laughs> surprise, surprise. OK, so I'm, uh, the, the one interesting aspect, very interesting aspect of your project is the, this question of scale and then engagement with the macro to them, because it's a macro problem that is spread all over the province. But you look at the micro, micro level of this. Um, I'm just wondering. Um, have you uh, disseminated those images yet publicly, say on social media and so on? Because I see a lot of potential for awareness campaign uh, because milfoil is uh, also spread because of like, okay, we tear up the plant, but there are boats, pedalos, whatever happens, like boating activities in general. Uh, so I'm just curious if you are thinking about reaching to organizations or reaching to different communities or towns or villages that are at risk with uh, with this plant? 
It's a really good question. Uh, there, there was a lot of um, campaigns uh, around being careful of not spreading milfoil because as I said, there's three like ways of easily spreading milfoil, uh, animals, human, and current. Um, and so it's more of like colonizing the other lakes by humans. And so um, the campaigns and that they did was really presenting milfoil as a devil. Mm -hmm. And it is it is super uh, endangering er ecosystems, but it's also beautiful. So I think there is an aspect of my project is maybe not I'm not a scientist, so I completely I don't understand fully the plant, but just like having an approach, visual approach, then you have like already a connection and a link to the, the plant. And I think presenting those pictures and even to all of you, you, you kind of connected you had now you have a relationship and you know what it milfo is and i think it would be a good idea to to reach out to those uh, organization and not pre like presented it maybe uh, as a more attractive not attractive but in a more uh, new way of communication not as a like devil don't do this and really like no but but there. but there is also uh, um forms of awareness that can be built say through workshops and hands-on activities it doesn't need to be a poster uh, on the road somewhere yeah. near a lake it could be something like a microscopy workshop but that travels across different communities that are uh, stuck with that problem of, of <laughs> yes. so yeah there are many, many possibilities. Congratulations. Are you ready for an AI question? No, I'm not. <laughs> but you will be. <laughs> so, so who is? So let's see what the AI has to ask about your project. Oh, well, what are some platforms that you researched? Well, uh, many platforms. So there's a lot of uh, communities. Um, of different like Quebec region that tackled the problem. So there's a lot of uh, not advertising, but uh, sens sensibilisé uh, documents um, on internet. There's also documentaries, um, and there's a scientist scientific uh, like documents. Yes, that's good. And the AI thinks you need YouTube, Netflix, the Concordia Library, and the B A N Q. <laughs> so thank you so much for your project. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Alex. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right. So I will invite everyone uh, to go this way. Uh, we will hear about uh, Mitchell's project presented by Alex. It's from my lab. It's from my lab. I have I'll tell you. Yo. Okay, so I'm going to present like a small presentation of the Mitchell uh, project, uh, which name is Frozen Tract. So the whole project is around um, tired dust in a nutshell, nutshell. So he actually tackled the invisible side effect of culture. So our involvement in sustainability, he discovered that when you recycle your uh, tire, there's only 90% of the tire that is still remaining in the materiality of it, and 10% is actually dust. So his whole process was um, trying to figure out how to separate dust, well, tire dust, to the rest of urban dust. And so the whole process he will explain because it's, it's pretty complicated, but yet simple. And so it's how to produce an object of the hypothetical. So go ahead. Um, Hello. So it's called frozen tracks, uh, not tracks like tracks, but it's a play on words, meaning an in indefinitely large extent of something. I'm going to be reading a, a lot of my writing because I could easily 
veer off track and uh, yeah, so the main goal of my project was to show was hidden so it could be seen and talked about. Uh, historically, relics of the past have been tied to empires of years gone by. But what about the modern era? What aspects of culture will endure? Unlike the past, byproducts of previous cultures and residue from the current culture will not vanish. The idea of byproduct is a necess necessary evil that some people may accept. But from a critical thinking point of view, I want to bring the unseen to light and make a place to talk about things that people have chosen not to see. We cannot, this is a quote, we cannot move our thinking beyond the subject if we don't know where the subject exists to begin with. On the other hand, focusing on and entrenching knowledge about a field can result in a closed perspective that does not encourage a person to view problems any different from that he or she has in the past. Um, so just to interject is this is, a, is an exploration of something that I found was hidden but needed to be brought to life before we could even have a discussion about it. Um, I chose to examine the enigmatic impact of the culture. Whoa. The enigmatic impact of tire culture across the world expressed in dust in a divided process. Divided in the sense that people love the idea of what a car could bring. It brings travel, it brings excitement, it brings like a freedom and adventure. And they just chose to focus on what they lust for as admission to the culture. But to claim that we're unaware of a global climate crisis is naive. Inhabitants of these developed cities are quite aware of this paradigm, and honestly, a majority of the time, we'll try to improve a negative situation. We'll try to do our best. Even in this uh, exhibition, we've seen people addressing issues of uh, sustainability, about walkability, walkable cities, and uh, uh, taking away the power from car culture. Um, one may think they are solving or addressing an issue surrounding sustainability, but unless all the factors are addressed, it's always going to remain a partial solution. I, chase, I chose to take a critical eye to the materialization and not waste anyone's time with a noble pursuit of a solution. I haven't got it. I decided to do things more in a, as if like a photojournalist who tries to catch important moments that might be lost to history otherwise. The main point of my presentation is to bring this frozen moment of time and raise a sharp look at the topic, which is rarely talked about, uh, to the foreground. Please understand this is not a panacea, but rather a discussion starter. A thought process, a thought experiment that a detailed analysis of my, a thought experiment rather than a detailed analysis of a, my processes, LSA, life cycle analysis. I also hope to leave it slightly ambiguous in order for people to interpret the conceptuality of the objects themselves. So moving forward. Um, Yes, I'll bring it closer. <sighs> yes. Okay, so uh, since the turn of the millennia, the world has pushed automotive production and culture to becoming the most centrifugal industry in the world. Uh, it shouldn't come as a surprise that such a voracious industry associated with so many negative outcomes. I chose to discuss one that is threatening and the least apparent in our daily lives. Um, it's tire dust. It's like, what? Tire dust, and uh, the annual tire production is around 1.4 billion per year. So if you divide that by four, it becomes a big number. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> oh my God, I don't have the result. Seven, about 17 million tires of used, 17 million tons of used tires every year. And people and the industry recommends that we change these tires every four to five years or at 60,000 K. Basically, I'm gonna get, the, the idea is that it ranges between 0.23 and 1.7 kilos of, of uh, tire dust that's produced per user, per, per, uh, per car, per year. And uh, that comes out to between 161,000 and 1.3 million tons of tire dust, which is invisible. And so I was presented with uh, this, this, this idea, like this thing is out there, but I have no way of like, you know, like, oh, look, there's tire dust, because it's, it's, it's inconceivable to find in presence of uh, natural um, occurring residue, like from, uh, from like a gravel, from earth, from trees, from human, human uh, uh, waste or products. So the, the, what I did was I went out to uh, sites and I, and I gathered, this is a bit of my research process, is I gathered the, the actual dust, but then I realized uh, that wasn't sufficient. I have a, uh, oh yeah, that's true. Hold on one second, I have a, uh, I actually have a, uh, 
I have a, a, cure, uh, a code that you could look at the, there's one sample. If anyone has a phone, they could look at the sample. There's this one sample, which I'll discuss later, but there's a water sample that uh, you could share. There's a... Is this one of those iPhones? Yeah, should be working. Does anyone else have a phone? Does anyone here have a phone? So if you want, this, this shows, this is a water test that I did so that I could see if it was, uh, if it was uh, the tire residue would show up. In a, did you get it? If the tire residue would show up in a, in a, water, in a water test, and uh, but it didn't react the way I wanted it, so that was one strike against me. And then I kept going on forward, and uh, and I wanted to see if it would work in another test, because this um, that test was a failure. So there was no way of uh, defining what I was looking for. This one is the microscopic version, which were thanks to uh, uh, Alice for the the use of the microscope. But this is actually on the hooklets, which is the smallest part of the uh, feather of a uh, bird feather. And uh, the, 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 the samples that are microscopic, and they could have been, they could have been uh, the, the samples that were present. Here's another one. I don't know why everyone's like 10,000 miles away. My thing's like the smallest exhibition in the world. So like, please come closer because you can't see what it is. So you'll, in that, ex that little example that I gave, it shows uh, it shows the, the the feather that I used, and there's like all these micro particles that are in there. But there's again, it could be anything else, and it's not uh, addressing the theoretical aspect of what I was searching for. Until I found magnetic testing, and you'd have to see this one here, and this was the final residue that finally clinched the fact that this thing is an actual existing. My theory came into fruition, and I was able to prove that it is because every test site that I went to, there was no metallic um, uh, residue around. They were uh, located in uh, in purely construct uh, concrete zones, and the, the the matter that I that I attracted from it uh, was reactive to magnetism. So that finally proved that this is in existence. To and it was congruent with this the amount of dust that I, I gathered and the amount of ferromagnetic material that I gathered. Um, what does this all mean? Um, so like, so like I took, I took a, I wanted, how do you show something that's transient like this? And how do you show something that is fleeting like that? I chose not the best method, like I said, but I wanted to do it as a photojournalist in the aspect four, that's my old crew, four. But uh, uh, in, in the aspect, I wanted to show something that was, uh, that could be sealed in time and then later discussed in, 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 a, in um, in a metaphorical sense. It's not something that's gonna be uh, expanded on now, but the idea that we could see it in its, uh, in its, in its true form, meaning, and kind of bringing a re uh, vitalization to, a, to a, an invisible process. So an illustration of an out of sight, out of mind, or, or accurately out of visual range, out of mind. We lack the perceptual ability to judge what we're capable of tackling in our environment that is immediately surrounding us. I hope that uh, this investigation reveals a means by which we could address some hidden factors that must be considered. Because if you think about it, if you give, like, say, if you recycle 95% of every coffee cup and you take 5% of it and you shoot it in the street, you're not really contributing to the entire process because you're unknowing that you're shooting 5% in the street. So it's a, just a little thing that I just thought I'd explore. On, and it was really uh, a challenge to find the methodology, the method of uh, research to get to the to this end result. That's it. Thank you. Okay. All right. I'd be curious. I don't see everyone, but 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 do we you have questions? Totally come closer and check it out. Do we have questions from the group about Miss Process? You can come closer. It's gonna be, I know that we're getting in the little corner, but uh, don't be shy. Any questions, comments about this? The less, the better. I do. 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, okay, I'm curious because you, you mentioned that yeah, the, the word proof in your presentation, and that is really uh, in, interesting and tense in a way because, I mean, what can we prove with art and research, research creation and design? So I'm just curious. Uh, because it, the way you spoke, it, it was almost like you developed a scientist, uh, scientific protocol to prove something. But uh, I'm not sure of that uh, design is meant to prove something, but rather to demonstrate, to monstrate, or show, or make us feel or experiment uh, things in a different way. So I'd be curious to hear you about that between the, 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 in your process, what do you consider a protocol, whether artistic or scientific? And do you see aligning your research with scientific protocols? Uh, good question, of course, that's why you're the teacher. Um, the, 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 goal, the goal was not to prove, uh, not to, to come out with the outcome, mostly that uh, it was it was there it was just to prove that there is there is an existing culture that has remnants that 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 can be identified not the fact that i was looking for the specific thing but i'm thinking that every method like every uh mode de vie has like a a, a resulting impact on the planet whether it's uh, obvious like uh like i don't know like fast food i don't know single unit plastics or if there's something that's less less demonstrationable than uh, like this which was almost impossible to find but the theory was there and i wanted to find kind of like uh that i'm not insane <laughs> imagining that this was there but it couldn't prove it i couldn't like i'm not scientific enough like i didn't go like like break it down with chemicals and find out what it was i had to find a way like methods of refinement of uh, seeing things and uh, through that seeing i saw what was not what that was invisible basically you know uh, and maybe one uh, one last comment. Uh, the images are quite interesting when you look at it on a big screen. I'd be curious how they look like if they're even bigger. Uh, the question of scale is extremely interesting. You could think it's space debris in water. This decontextualization is really interesting. So I really encourage you to experiment with that. And my last question is, maybe you mentioned it and I didn't hear it. What is that fossil material? We'll get you another one. Here. It's padding. Sorry about that. Sorry. Um, what was the question again? Sorry. What is that fossil material? Oh, the fossil, it's a uh, part, uh, it's a bit of a mistake because uh, it didn't really actually uh, promote any uh, uh, positive aspect to the material that I gathered. Like there's no reconstructing of the material in a positive way. I used it as a purely narrative uh, narrative uh, tool so that I could show and f literally freeze something. And there was not like if I brought ice, it would have been too transitional in the time that I had. So I wanted to be able to, be, like I said, like I did the comparison of a photojournalist in a war zone. They're not doing like anything at all to help the war at all except taking the photo and showing the image of what exists and bringing it back to some people that could have a discussion and say like, oh, I never realized that there's so predominant an amount of this. Now we could have a, we could have a dialogue discussing this, this aspect of, uh, of, our, of our culture, of our car culture, you know? Thank you. Uh, I think you are ready for an AI question. Oh, I have, I've been waiting my whole life. Nick, are you ready? This mic was fine, by the way. <laughs> Not to me. Okay, you ready? Sure am. What can engagement with the material lead to? Well, that's a future forward question. Yeah. It could it could re, it could lead to a scientific re, uncovered new. I'm not. I, I'm talking like that beauty pageant that really screwed up right there. Um, it could lead to uh, new new methodologies for dealing with this uh, this material because there's a lot of ferromagnetic uh, materials. In my example, we could reuse the materiality of the object that's been lost and discarded. Now that we know it's existed, there could be a way to to harness it and to recover it and use it in another method. I'm sure that's not what it's going to say as the answer. I hope it's verbatim. <laughs> More sustainable scenarios for the future? Well, I'll do not. 
No, it's, it's a good one. It's a good one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, with that future forward answer, uh, we'll take a five short, five short five minute break. Okay, so uh, we'll be back. So those online, stay with us. All right. Uh, thanks uh, for your patience to all our Zoom audience. We are going to continue, and Mitch uh, will introduce Joel's project. We need a mic. Charged. Oh my god. That's totally charged. I love this class. Um, Joelle is doing an awesome presentation about uh, mycelium, and uh, she wants to incorporate it into uh, uh, an eco and affordable method of dealing with um, domestic waste and combat the, the preconcepts that were faced to the same way that recycling was faced uh, in the past decades. And so that uh, awareness and eventual integration as, a, as an ideology. Okay, so uh, my project community plastic, is that on? Yeah, okay. So my project communities, plastic waste and fungi is a participatory bioremediation uh, project uh, that explores the uh, use of mycelium to uh, break down uh, plastic waste, uh, so petrochemical uh, waste, but uh, specifically in my case, in the form of uh, textile uh, waste. Um, at the beginning of my process, I was intending to actually work in a lab and uh, conduct my experiments there, but I soon realized that uh, it was a better approach to take it out of the lab and into uh, my home in the hopes to uh, so come up with a a practice that I could uh, share with other people um, in the hopes of like bringing awareness uh, to this and being able to uh, to um, implement it, like bring uh, awareness on the levels of the cities and uh, maybe uh, governments uh, to uh, implement this in a wider uh, in a wider way. Uh, so what my research looks like right now, uh, I've tested uh, three types of uh, mushroom species, and I have um, put them in contact with uh, three uh, families of textile wastes. Uh, the first of them is uh, entirely petrochemicals, so synthetic fibers. Um, it includes uh, polyfill. Uh, um, one of these uh, blue masks that we were all during the pandemic and uh, nylon stockings. Um, then to have other examples of how it would react with uh, more easily to break down fibers. I have a family of fibers that is uh, mixed fibers, so cotton with nylon spandex. Um, and then another family is completely natural fibers, so which is supposed to be easier to break down. Um, in an effort to keep this like um, easily to achieve at home, I used mostly materials that I already owned. Um, altogether, I purchased a total of uh, material for a total of uh, 34 and 30 cents, uh, which includes the liquid culture. Um, the master mix, which is the substrate in which the mycelium grows. Uh, it's made of sawdust and uh, soy husks. 
and those grow bags that are um, it's easy to, it, it's harder to work with if you don't have this professional tool but it's readily available online so uh, if anyone wanted to uh, try to make this at home it's easy to order online for and it's very low cost um, the first step was to um, one of the biggest thing I had to figure out to do it at home was how to sterilize without any professional equipment uh, this involved a lot of uh washing boiling uh putting things in the oven uh, steaming again and uh all up until the mushrooms are in the bag uh, when they're in the bag you're actually good to go because it's a it's gonna be safe it's gonna be in its little home so you could just like let it sit there and you don't have to worry about contamination anymore um, it's now been a month since uh, the mycelium is growing it is still too early to find out if uh, the fibers that were included in those grow bags is going to be uh, actually broken down at all if it's going to be returned to soil it's also not uh, early too early to find out if the mushroom that have started to grow are safe to consume as food uh, and that's what i'm going to find out in probably one month from now uh, my next steps are um, to gather a few people who are interested in mycology who might want to test it at home and uh, for, uh, find out best practices and uh, build workshops that could be given in um, places where they're interested in mycology, uh, eco quartier, like school environments, places like Frigo Vert, community uh, areas. So uh, one of my dissemination tools that I've like this is the prototype of my little zine that I can just leave in those spaces and uh, hopefully uh, like minded people would like see that and it would get their interest. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Joelle. I think you have uh, questions already. Yes. Uh, okay, yeah, just first of all, you said that you you wanted to know if they were comestible, like uh, safe to eat. How exactly are you going to test that out? Uh, I'm <laughs> going to uh, go to uh, the chemistry, uh, reach out to the chemistry Concordia and oh. actually get it tested, mostly for phthalates, which are uh, what is a uh, carcinogen in uh, in uh, the plastics like uh, the PET bottles so that would be what I'd be more most worried about and uh, also uh, of, as, a, as a side note all mushrooms that you grow like in that in that form and uh, everything besides mushrooms you buy at the grocery store needs to be cooked anyways that's for bacteria and things like that so that I'm not worried about. Okay. Thank you. Thanks for uh, this effort. Do you have any other questions from the group? No? Uh, you have another question, yeah. Yeah. Oh, Okay. Um, so I think from the big, like, what did you intend originally on having here today? Because I feel like from what you've said, it feels like you slowly uh, acknowledge that it, it was a process that was taking a longer, much longer time than you expected. Mm -hmm. So how did that change like versus like what you originally thought of bringing here today and what you were able to, to achieve? Uh, well, how my project, uh, how my project changed is that I originally thought I would 
uh, I come from a fashion industry background, so I, already, I thought I would use some uh, ways like offcuts from some of my friends who are designers in different places where they use di different types of fabric. But uh, 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 for time, uh, because of time constraints and because I uh, have uh, some like the the participatory uh, approach, I just decided that it was more interesting to like first do it at home, and then when it's actually a thing to like uh, take it to the next level. Figure it out on your own and then, then disseminate it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, well, thank you. Thanks for uh, these interesting questions. Uh, I do have some questions for you, Joel. I'm, I'm curious, um, in your future research, you want to create a participatory workshop. Where do you want your participants uh, to, to go with that workshop? Because it's, um, it's a long process. A workshop is a an event that is timed within a specific uh, mm -hmm. time frame. So, yeah. How do you want to approach that? On which aspect would you focus on? Uh, I would um, try to build an online community, whether it be with people that are working with mycelium right now uh, and would like to test this process uh, with uh, people that work if, if for um, in a, like a community work that would like it be interested to, uh, to to try it as it's there's actually and hobbyists like i i approached it as a hobbyist mm -hmm. uh, of like uh, there and i know it's like a lot of effort and it's not just like my hobby is knitting and then i just like sit and like i have my my yarn and i do this it's like a lot of in time investment and and it could easily go wrong but uh, from my experience in that kind of groups and communities i, I think it could work uh, my next question deals with the, uh, I would say, design aspect or s formal aspect of the project. Uh, because at that stage, it's really, okay, it's an ex experimental setup where you work with, with all those materials and you try to well, decompose them in order to grow something else. It's really interesting that kind of process of survival despite, I would say, harsh conditions is really interesting. But after that, I'm just wondering what's left in the sense that with mycelium, there's also a possibility to build object with a specific form in mind. I would, I don't know, a sculpture, yeah. something molded. Is this, uh, so you keep a trace of the process in the end. Is this somewhere uh, you, you wanna go or you wanna keep the, the process really, uh, I would say, focused on the material transformation itself? Uh, no, I'm also interested in that part. Of course, as you said, it's exploratory right now, but I think this is this would be a great tool to to uh, bring awareness because uh, like the object, like the the residual object that becomes functional, is is uh, would be something that uh, a lot of people would have interested. Yeah, great. Uh, I think uh, our AI wants to ask a question to your fungi. Yes, absolutely. So <laughs> let's do that right away. Ooh, where does the material go when we can no longer see it? Well, the, the, uh. the material is there whether we see it or not, right? So, um, and it it just it, it just like and even if it changes form, it um, like yeah, it uh, it precedes us and it will survive us. <laughs> rien ne se perd, rien ne se crée, tout se transforme. Yeah. Right. Well, thank so, you so much. Okay. And we're now on to our next project. Yeah. The, oh no, what's the answer? I'm so sorry. Oh, the I, answer, the answer. Where, where does the material go? Why is the answer. Yeah. So, <laughs> you, I guess you had the only answer available. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> All right. So the next project will be a manual service project presented by Joël. Uh, so we invite you to just uh, come here. So, uh, yeah. You guys want to get closer? Yeah, I would invite everyone to come around here. Yeah, should we turn off the lights, Emmanuel? Okay. Okay, so quick introduction since we might miss batteries. Metalscapes Beyond uh, Digital Landscape aims to bring, bridge the gap between the material and the digital using digital projection on two different technological artifacts. Um, so I have a few questions for you, Manuel, first. Uh, you explored uh, projecting on uh, many different surfaces. Um, if you could tell us a little bit uh, how it has evolved and uh, what you have discovered through this process. Yes, thank you, uh, Joel. Um, so throughout my research um, in the city, just trying to uh, projection map on different things with a little Pico projector. Um, it brought me to, you know, uh, look at things in a sort of different way. Um, some some material that we kind of pass by every day and not think about, some, some forgotten artifacts, I would say. Uh, so throughout my research, I did a lot, I did a lot of projections on metal, I realized. So I decided to kind of focus on that, uh, but always like trying to find that bridge between the material and the digital um, because for some reason it just interested me so much so yeah essentially and then um, to the guidance of Alice um, you know uh, and recuperating the, these um, these motherboards these circuit boards you know they're quite interesting and I want to kind of uh, showcase you know the manufacturing, the the kind of extractivist nature of technological uh, instruments that we use every day, um, and use them as a surface to project those images on. So that was that bridge between the digital and the material. These artifacts aim. Uh, these art artifacts they they act as a screen. That's usually kind of pure. That's usually kind of uh, not thought about specifically. But here it's quite complex. You can't really decipher what the images are. Uh, and I kind of like the beauty of that because of the kind of complex processes that, um, you know, these materials go through to become what this is. So essentially, um, these are a series of images of the production of steel, iron, um, rare metals, the facilities within, uh, I mean, factories that produce these sort of uh, instruments and also the kind of environmental impact through the factory smoke that you can kind of see over there. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, so that's essentially it. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have questions from the group? Comments? Yeah, you do, go ahead. Oh yeah. I'm not even sure, uh, maybe you mentioned it, but I was just wondering, where did you find these materials, like these completely opened parts? Where yes, uh, actually, Alice had a bag in her office. No. <laughs> Oops, something happened. How convenient. Uh, <laughs> yeah, and they just turned out to be so beautiful. Uh, and mm. thank you again, Alice. Uh, <laughs> it's nice to... to Clean up my office. Yeah. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's nice to reuse and recontextualize these, these artifacts when they're they're just uh, yeah modern fossils exactly yeah. when their their expiry date is, is out. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. And um, well, I have questions, but I will let the group speak first. Any other questions? 
comments? Oh, yes, Rachel, go ahead. Hello. Um, I was there when you got the circuit boards. Um, right. And we had a really interesting conversation about your project afterwards. And I was just wondering if you could like spell out what that was like for you, like once you received these, once you knew that you could work with this material and that you could have it as part of your project, like what was going through your mind and uh, especially with regards to how it relates to the uh, digital media that you are planning on projecting onto it. Right, right. The wonderful question. Thank you, Rachel. You're very uh, welcome. <laughs> um, essentially, when I first saw these, I was I said, "Wow, it's beautiful!" Right? They're they're like, you know, like like I think Bjork had said something like this. The oh, they're little wonderful cities, and you can just kind of play around with them. And I see it. I see it the same way because um, they're just 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 kind of beautiful to look at, but also. Uh, Finding the nature of the digital image was essentially what I wanted to do as well, right? Um, so this is kind of the bridge. When I saw this, this was kind of the bridge between um, what is the what the the, the, the the digital image is composed of is primarily like the hardware behind it, and then I thought it'd be cool, obviously, to use it as a surface to display digital images. So. Thanks for uh, this question and also the answer. Uh, I have a question, well, many questions. First one uh, pertaining to process, uh, because it's, uh, it's a semester long uh, project that is iterative in many ways, and that is, I would say, propelled by many heuristic moments and process based uh, moments. Uh, but uh, I saw, and sorry if I'm like disclosing things from your process, <laughs> but uh, I saw like in, through the semester, there was this challenge in your work about making a choice uh, for images. Mm -hmm. What images, what surface, and why? And I'd like to hear you about that because it's, a, it's I'm at one point, whether in design, in the arts, or, or anywhere, you have, we have to create that kind of subjective assemblage of Oh well, this is the piece. Okay, so be don't tell me that you had a deadline because <laughs> that's not what I want to hear. No, no. <laughs> okay, yeah. no, but I'm curious about like I know that you went in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, I know that you did other forms of experiments, and I'm really curious to hear you about this exploratory uh, journey before you 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 decided to go that route because now the project is much more focused on uh, this kind of. Um, um, I would say mise en abyme or like meta uh, look at the computer itself as a form of, uh, as a way to produce images and how they're made in terms of rare earth metals, in terms of mining and in terms mm -hmm. of other problematics. But in the beginning, you were much more in the urban. Mm -hmm. So can you uh, talk about this transition? I'm really curious. Yeah, that's, uh, that's very interesting. It's, uh, at first, I did want to focus on the built environment, of course, a uh, different uh, macro uh, materials in the built environment, um, which was, yeah, essentially the purpose. And like you said, finding the imagery uh, to project on these different surfaces was a challenge. Uh, it was, I didn't really know like how to go about that, like finding some very kind of uh, natural landscapes, uh, some like uh, insects pollinating flowers, such as on like a you know, cobblestone or something. As I tried to make a sort of contrast, I tried to make these sort of connections, you know, within the built environment. But uh, this thinking more about the things that we use every day, like our computers, our phones, our tablets, um, I, I believe it still pertains to our built environment, um, to a macro scale as well, not only where we are, but just the huge flux, influx of uh, smartphones just going all around the world. So. I think um, using this medium to project on is uh, speaks a little more to the uh, the built environment on a micro scale. Thank you, Manuel. My Do pleasure. We, Thank you. So I think uh, the AI is uh, really looking forward uh -oh. <laughs> to asking you a question. Penny, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. 
What can engagement with the material lead to? Did we already have this I question? I think we did, yeah. I think we need you to. You know what? You get another one. Okay, cool. I think the Thank AI you. needs more training. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I need to hit generate. I think we had one or two uh -oh. separate things also. Okay. Yeah. I started to run out of this room. Uh-oh. <laughs> Third time. What is an interesting opportunity to explore what defines an image and its associations? Oh. I'll repeat it again. <laughs> what is an interesting opportunity to explore what defines an image and its associations? This one is for you, Manuel. Yeah, yeah, this is a good one. Thank you. Um, what is an interesting opportunity to explore what defines an image and its associations? Uh, I believe it's just to uh, I guess look at images in, in a different context, I guess, in a different environment, um, whether it's digital or printed. Um, I believe just focusing on the time it was produced, who produced it, um, you know, that sort of thing, and, and try to kind of find connections between that and how the, the, the nature of the, the image became or came to be. So, yeah, I guess uh, it definitely relates to its own contextual associations. Um, hope that sort of answers the question a little bit. <laughs> Let's see what the AI has to say. Yeah. Different types of generated and found materials. All right, yeah. That's <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, all right. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right, okay. thank you. Uh, I will encourage the group to uh, cross the corridor here <laughs> and go through Manuel's piece. So we attend to Sarah's piece presented by Manuel. Do we have two microphones? Oh, I, I have okay. my own. Okay, great. Thanks, Sarah. Am I already? Oh, yeah. I'm, okay. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. So I've been given the great pleasure to introduce Sarah's project um, called Datascapes, Datascapes, yes, yes. Um, which essentially is a critique on this mass corporation corporations algorithm, the Sheen, Sheen's website, uh, where they they feed they feed off your data, off your information to <laughs> to give you recommendations, these weird kind of recommendations on their site. And Sarah saw this as an opportunity uh, to make a sort of extension of this as a way, a fun way to critique it. Um, so without further ado, I'll give you yeah, um, a I think uh, an MC is uh, doing something to my screen right now. Uh, so I'll try not being, okay. So uh, yes, thank you for introducing my project. Uh, so. It's just being shared on the screen. Oh. So this, my, my project is here, if you want to see, because oh, yeah, there's yeah. not a lot oh, to see here. Okay, so. <laughs> so my project is a Google, um, Google Chrome extension. Um, and it's made to kind of embed itself within your kind of sheen experience, although I, I hope that with this you, you don't kind of want to have a sheen experience. So um, the genesis of my project, like uh, Manuel uh, introduced, is um, basically how it embeds itself within a bigger question that I have about how the data that we create online and the data that's being collected from us uh, impacts the objects that we consume, especially for a giant retailer like Sheen. If you don't know, it's a fashion retailer. Uh, online only, and uh, they use a ton of algorithms to collect data from their clientele and infer forecasting trends, and that then infer on productions that all that happen like in real time, so that your own online behavior and how you uh, behave either. Uh, on Sheen's website, but also on your social media, on your own personal interfaces, impact directly what Sheen is going to sell in three days. Um, so with 6,000 new products on average 
every single day that gets to the website, there's um, they Sheen surpasses by very far any kind of fast fashion brand, uh, at least their production volume. And uh, because they share so many products, when you personally go on Sheen's websites, you will be targeted with only the products that Sheen thinks you'll buy for sure, or that will keep you on, like keep you interested in on the website. A little bit like uh, algorithms like Instagram and Facebook does. So Sheen is a little similar in that way. And so I was, the genesis of my project really started with this, um, the far right camisole that you see uh, moving here was really the genesis of my project. I found it on Sheen while I was scrolling. And the more you look at it, the less it makes sense. And people in this class have already uh, seen it. I showed it in my proposal. And it, it looks like a robot, like got the idea of a bra and the idea of a cami and kind of put it together and threw it back to its customers. And I kind of wanted to find a way to First of all, find all the products that look like that that Sheen does that make that are completely absurd, but also to kind of redirect the narrative uh, of the person, the client, and make them wonder why was I presenting presented with that specific product from Sheen? Sheen thinking this is made for me and I'm going to buy this based only on my online behavior and how I interact on screen. So I, my idea was kind of to come up with a, a little bit of a cabinet of curiosities from only Sheen's products. And it's a participatory uh, thing. So a bunch of people today inputted their own journal entries here. Uh, that first row is not me. So how to participate? Well, you just go on Sheen's website and you go to clothings or anything and you're tasked to find a very absurd, or I want to say stupid product. And I know everyone's seen that dress, I think. So like, for instance, this one, um, that's just a breath away from being so many problems. Uh, <laughs> but then again, Sheen targeted me with that dress thinking I would want it. And I know why, it's because I've, I've clicked on it many times because it's a very good example for this project. So how I would go about is just basically an extension, a Google Chrome extension that I just opened. And instead of adding to your bag, you would add the product to your journal and then enter a little prompt as to why you think uh, Sheen targeted you with this particular thing, or maybe what you think it's meant for, or what you think Sheen, you know, when or when would you wear that? And so you input that little prompt, you add the product to your journal, and then you can view everyone else's like inputs and little entries and just scroll through that little cabinet of curiosities or of absurd uh, little objects of Sheen. So that's more or less uh, my, my, yeah, my project. Like these, but yeah, there's so much. There's so much to discuss, but that's me. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Do we have questions from the group or comments? Uh, I have a question, actually. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Um, so when, like, what do you think that, uh, like, the Sheen website, when they collect your information, do they produce AI-generated content and then to show you and then they produce it or? The... The very hard thing about my project, and I knew that from the very beginning because I really fell into a rabbit hole of like researching on Sheen. Um, I took Sheen as a case study specifically because the company is a black box. It has no financial statements online and like where like a lot of companies is kind of like a, a go to a, like an except like it, it's just something that they do, but there's really very little information about what Sheen does and how they go about doing it. Um, so a lot of my research was based on complete speculation and like trial and error and trying to figure out how they do it without really understanding it. 
And that's why I wanted to do this like low tech version of like trying to figure out for yourself how they use that algorithm and how they fetched your information. But I do know that uh, the, the behavior they, um, they collect, it goes outside of their website. Uh, it goes onto social media because it's a mainly social media based uh, retailer. It, most all of their advertising goes through um, social media and stuff like that, like calls and TikTok content creators. So a lot of what they collect is based off of who you follow, who you like, what kind of things you're like, uh, your browsing history, like things that are very, very personal and I would say almost intimate. And yeah, so I don't know if that answers your question. No, for but sure. It's kind that's of scary, my answer. but yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, uh, we have Nicole. another question here. It's more, oh, um, it's more a comment, oh, actually a question and a comment. Um, well, actually, you answer the question being it, it sort of moves beyond the website into social media because I know your obsession with Sheen. And <laughs> I just I just yes. followed her yesterday on Instagram and I I got like a, some random message from Sheen saying I won. $1, yeah, that's because of me. <laughs> so I'm like, oh shit! Now they found me. I'm sorry. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you so much, Rachel. Thank you. Any any other question? Yes, Joel. Um. You just piqued my curiosity. Like, uh, are, would you be interested to actually investigate Sheen like beyond this? Like, if like uh... I, I I I kind of did. <laughs> like, well, I I think I I would. Sorry, I don't even know. Were you done with your question? Yeah, Excuse yeah. Me, cut you off. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I like the rabbit hole I fell into was very very deep. <laughs> I read. The entire privacy policy of Sheen, and I, I, I was taken aback, and I just didn't want to be on internet anymore. <laughs> um, but yeah, definitely, I think it'd be something that's interesting. But then again, I was like, when I was um, coding this thing, I was sure that this Sheen agent was going to come to my door and being like, "Why did you refresh <laughs> this product two thousand times today? What is wrong with you?" But and I did run into some stuff. So just uh, as a side note, um, all these information that I've picked on, the images, the, the prices, the titles, all of those are from directly from the uh, Sheen website. And I had to extract those with JavaScript and HTML elements and all that whatnot. And I had to inspect like the HTML markup of that page so I could find all of those elements. So I really went into the code of Sheen's websites, which was incredibly interesting because I didn't think I would find that much information onto the code. And um, when I was reading the privacy policy, I read something about mega uh, tracking pixels, which are not cookies, so you cannot decline or agree to them. They're just there. And in very, very short terms, tracking pixels are hidden. One pixel that's completely hidden on uh, that website browser, and it's sent to a third party uh, company. So it's not the actual company you're browsing onto. And all of your clicking and online behavior are collected from that pixel and sent to that third party company. And that practice is in very much questioned in uh, the, the computational community. Uh, and But it, it's no laws protect consumers against it. It's just there, and it's on all websites. And while I was digging into the code of Sheen, I was actually able to find that pixel. And I was able to track down the company that they, uh, they, they use to, to track all those behaviors. So it was kind of a fun thing to be able to really dig deeper into Sheen as code, not algorithm, but it's still a code, and to get to know them a little bit more on that side. It was definitely fun. <laughs> but I'm scared now. <laughs> I think we have a question online uh, from Jean-Philippe Coté. Yes, I'm, I'm home, but I'm here. 
I've been, I, I've been meaning to ask a few questions, but uh, I don't think I've been noticed so far. That's okay. Um, I, I really uh, love this project. Uh, I, I remember your presentation after the, the midterm. It was uh, it was awesome. Um, it's not so much of a question uh, and perhaps more of a of a suggestion, but um, yeah. From what you're saying, you've you've dug into the the technical aspects of uh, of this whole thing, and I'm I'm guessing this might have been uh, overwhelming at at some point. But have you considered uh, uh, if you ever want to pursue this, uh, contacting like some socially engaged hacker spaces or, or like groups of people that just might help you out with this? Because I I like I said uh, after your midterm presentation, I think there is real value in there, and this could probably be ported to different platforms sheen being your 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 test yeah. case um but i can totally see this thing as a as a as a political tool uh in terms of negotiating our relation with with data privacy and 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 uh, and whatever they do with the uh this uh, this data that, that they collect so i don't know uh perhaps that that would be a way to to follow up on that project well, thank you so much for your comment. It's super appreciated. Um, I, well, okay, there's many steps in your uh, question. There are very few little information made available online uh, about Sheen. I've said it uh, already. And there are very few people who do research on like the the impact of such a giant corporation having such a monopoly but i did find one github <laughs> where someone has uh, an extensive study of like statistical statistics about sheen um and like that is a one person i would be reaching out if i were to continue that project and still as a sheen case study but while i was uh developing that tool i found out that it's not only Sheen, like I, I made Sheen my nemesis this uh, semester, but I also went on Levi's site and Levi's uses tracking pixels as well. So like, but, and it's not only about Levi's, but it's like everyone is more or less doing the same thing and collecting our data and inferring objects with them. Uh, so of course, it was easier to just like keep it down to like one big entity. But I was also thinking of using Pinterest because those like the 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 action of pinning stuff and like the the algorithm that generates only what you want to see are kind of very similar in behavior. So of course there would be a ton of possibilities to be added on to that uh, extension, just obviously for research resources um, and time and just it, it was so hard <laughs> the mechanics of like building this extension were it, yeah extensive to say the least but i'm really happy with the result but of course it would be much expandable Sorry. thank you jean philippe for the question and thank yeah, you sarah for uh, your your answer um, if I may ask a question, it's a, both a question and comment. Maybe I can come with you. So, but because after that we are going to conclude. Uh, well, first my comment. Uh, congratulations for this project. I think it's very interesting, critically, uh, in terms of building those uh, uh, interventions furtives uh, that are easily accessible, that can disseminate to a wide number, and it's uh, it's extremely rich and powerful in terms of engaging with a wide audience and engaging with many people. So how can you raise awareness and, and, and include different communities in your projects uh, and communities that would not necessarily go to an art gallery or to a show. So this is a very powerful way creating that extension Chrome extension to disseminate a project, I find it really interesting. And, and then, this is probably a question, uh, I was looking at the Eli uh, rock cut uh, shirt, denim shirt. Oh, booty denim the, shirt. The, yeah, exactly, this one. <laughs> and I was like, okay, and it made me think about all those Amazon fail websites where people buy a t-shirt and then they receive a t-shirt for their hamster, but they have no yeah. hamster. So I'm just wondering, if, like, there are tons of blogs like that if you ever want to procrastinate. So uh, I'm, I'm just curious, did you uh, finalize the process with Sheen at one point? Did you buy from Sheen? No. 
Are you interested in trying one? I mean, I'm just the, genuinely just wondering, the only like, thing I'm interested in buying at this point is this this cami because I I've been looking at it for so long at this point I need to own it. Um, but so I I've, I've been talking to this to a number of people today. But again, always coming from a place of speculation. Sheen is a black box. I won't have my answers dead on. But my own interpretation is that. Basically, Sheen takes a process that usually takes like an entire season to come up with a design, to find the fabric, to uh, throw it in production, to disseminate, disseminate it. So, you know, like uh, things that are for spring summer 2023 are usually started in spring summer 2022. Uh, but Sheen has a turnaround of pro product of like two or three days like from the moment they take that collection of data and they infer a trend with it they send in a production and that piece is going to go to the website within two or three days so that that dress uh oh, you can't see it can you okay that dress it's like 64 dollars that looks like uh, a, a barbie dress which is hilarious my guess is they took those pictures as inspiration, uh, put it in the, like, created their own product with it that would be able to cost client $64, put them on the website, but they put the picture, the inspiration picture as their product picture, and they're going to send you whatever they were able to do that is worth $64. So it's not going to be the same fabrics, probably not going to be the same pattern, but it's inspired by that product. So I'd be very curious uh, to, to see a process from um, A to Z. Um, I know that you don't want to give yeah, your credit card I, number yeah. to Sheen, but I'd be just like for the experience to see like the onboarding process until the checkout, until you receive the whole thing. Yeah. So that, yeah. It, I was thinking of doing it, but then I, I, I thought of the um, project you presented and I, I can't remember the name. It was just like a gigantic, enormous pit um that was oh who was the artist and he was critiquing all of this um landfill material but then he created this enormous pit with it and left it there and it became like a very like a problematic um oh my god now i'm blanking on the name and i'm blanking on my own lectures yeah that's, <laughs> that's, that's like, what you wanted to be talking about but it's how like <laughs> I didn't want to be the cause of the problem that I'm critiquing, you know, yeah. so there was a bit of a dichotomy in that. I understand. Um, but I, 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 I might, but that to me is like really reminiscent of this entire project for me. And uh, one last question and then it's going to be a AI oh, time no. question. <laughs> Hey, you said it uh, it uh, generates six thousand designs. What was the number? Six thousand on average, six thousand new products every day. Yeah. So, so is, and is, some statistics say higher. Wouldn't it it be uh, like an investigative? Uh, the idea that something can generate six thousand new products itself is a neutral as a neutral concept is a very uh, it's dizzy. advanced, you know, like concept that something that could generate. But in this case, it's used for blatant, like, one-off fashion. Is there any way that you could you could scrape the data and, and reintegrate it into something like ways to generate to six thousand different charities or six thousand different methods of recycling, like, or you know, like using the same power that it, it generates those those six thousand new designs? Like, use that yeah. engine, whatever engine they're using, and and uh, yeah. processing power in another way, like to recon recontextualize it? That's a really interesting question. I really didn't think about it that way. Because um, I was really like, there's this, like, there's this psychic numbing that happens when we talk about that much product, that many products, like Sheen is not a brick and mortar. People don't realize that there's this entire materiality of objects behind it. The, the Sarah Ahmed in queer phenomenology, <laughs> that word, um, said that there, there's no materiality to the object if you can't reach for it. And 
I was going in that direction for my project. And I kind of let go of all these big numbers that don't necessarily bring a sense of understanding of or comprehension of the situation. And I really wanted to get it down to like you and one object. Like, what do you think your relationship to that one specific object is? So I, I didn't go in that direction, but it would be a really intriguing, uh, interesting direction to go in. But yeah, I really wanted to get it down to the ma micro level instead. Uh, one last comment question, quickly. Yeah. Um, I wanted to voice just like my appreciation of the, like, the format you chose to explore this in kind of similar to what Jean Philippe said in the in the chat. Um, exploring this kind of like weird black box algorithm that you don't really have a means of understanding and turning it into a journal where people can actively pick out something that they find silly or un inexplicable and just voice like what they think it's connection to the it like really reclaims the intentionality of Thank like. You this weird online algorithmic shopping experience. I, I appreciate that way of going about it. Thank a lot. you so much. And yeah, with like, uh, I, I really tried to attempt to kind of go about like the same aesthetic of Sheen so that when you click on the, the, the plugin, it really feels like it's a, embedded within the experience of Sheen. So I use the same fonts, I use the same buttons, I use like there, there was a lot of overlap between like their add to bag and add product to journal. So yeah, I really wanted to make this the experience cohesive. So thank you for noticing it. <laughs> have to conclude, uh, but we can pursue the discussion after, but we will conclude with a, an AI question. Oh, we don't have to. <laughs> We've got one more question from the AI. <laughs> Sarah, are you ready? No. Okay. You're gonna actually get a bonus round, you're gonna get two. <laughs> of course. Oh, uh, can't use that one. You can't. I, I couldn't answer. Okay. What are some ways to use digital media in a critical form to bring awareness to the separation of the body mind within a real world? Wow. That's I I, yeah, I think we, we, we got that one already. No, no. <laughs> no, no, that's it. Really. <laughs> um, of the body mind well i think it of course in in my project that makes me think of what i just talked about about sarah ahmed and queer phenom phenomenology um is yeah like digital media as in sheen uses that body mind dichotomy because by only being online and i know they're they're starting to open brick and mortars but they haven't i think yet by only being online they really create that psychic numbing of not like clients not being able to understand how like the sheer quantity of things they're like scrolling through actually exist they they are embodied they are material things but they don't realize it. They're invisible processes because they're not yet material as long as they're not in front of them. If they're in through a screen, it's completely inconsequential to them. And But I want to bring into the digital media, bring that sense of awareness of um, your mind, your personal intimate data are embodied, are materialized through these objects that are very, very much material, whether or not you're consuming them through a screen. So I think I kind of made sense of that question. I like that you were looking at me when you answered. Yeah, let's hear it for Sarah. And let's hear it for the answer. If the digital world is a simulacrum of reality, that doesn't. <laughs> yes. Is, yeah. Yes. It's, it yeah. was not another question. It was an answer. <laughs> hmm. All right. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. Uh, I'm, I'm just curious, did, the, did someone in the group plan closing remarks, or I'm doing the closing remarks? Uh, <laughs>
<laughs> you want to do, do it? it. Oh, the AI do it? Yeah. yeah. How come we don't have closing remarks from the AI? Well, first of all, I want to thank uh, all presenters today. Thanks for your projects. Thanks for uh, it's. it's it's a, yeah. Thanks for your engagement in organizing this afternoon and the originality of the formula. Uh, I'm glad I've met your AI. I was confronted to it, uh, but I'm even happier to uh, have, have the chance to uh, see those fantastic projects that deal with materiality, both digital living, uh, waste, infrastructural, uh, urban, uh, the, the, the diversity of your projects is incredible. And the questions that are asked by all of your research is also fantastic. Um, and I think most importantly, um, I want to thank you for taking the risk uh, of going uh, a little bit off track this semester, taking the chance to work on a project that does not necessarily have an end. Uh, I hope that it was a productive step in your process, in your future ideas, in your future research. And I think that ideas travel, method travel, uh, and I hope you will bring some of them further with you. Thank you. And, and before we end uh, this, uh, this session, uh, I would like to invite everyone to come back tomorrow afternoon, same time, uh, for the second uh, session of this critical mediation series. <laughs>